Right, this is going to be another episode of Thorin and Loco versus Worlds. <laughs> but Worlds is already over. So as you've guessed, there's not too many more of these we can grind out in that particular <laughs> series. Like eventually, we will have to transition it to a new series name because who knew that it would... I mean, you know, obviously from Loco's past, I didn't know if there was ever a future after Worlds for him. So, you know, <laughs> wow. just like in the Sorry. TSM days, I had you've to see where it was going. You've never been to Worlds. No, I haven't. I actually have. I went as a spectator once, mate. So yeah. That's all that matters. Sit the fuck so, down. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't worry about it, mate. <laughs> anyway, also I work on real esports world championships like the major in CSGO. So <laughs> what about this then? So what we're going to do for this episode is we're going to mm. do like, uh, not a recap because that would imply we're going to talk about every match, but we're going to do like a post-Worlds episode. As in, let's look back now at the whole tournament and let's see like, interesting storylines that came out of it or things that maybe changed during the tournament. Now, as usual, this episode is brought to you by GG Esports, which is a site where you can play. You can play with the coins, which transfer to gems, which transfer to other stuff. But we'll get to some of that later in the episode as it is appropriate to reference it. For now, we vet welcome again one of our... Well, it's been on a couple of episodes. We're a veteran back again. And here's the thing, veteran. Didn't Loco try and imply that he was going to like laugh in your face when Fnatic lost Worlds or some bullshit like that? I just thought we'd yeah. get out of the way at the beginning, shall we? I'm, I'm not going to sit here and gloat. Yes, I am. What the fuck do you mean? Oh my God, better. And like, you told me IG solo lane difference wouldn't matter that much. I told you Ning and Bao Lin would not play oh. like Monkey from group. Like, I just, everything I said, I was right. I will give I... you points. You, you gave were more me so articulate. many openings in that. You gave me so were, many openings. You were more articulate, but I was right. Mm. Apparently not so articulate enough because you didn't hear a word I said, no matter how many times I said it. Uh, what I definitely said was that it's not going to matter because counter picks are going to win said lanes, no matter what. And Fnatic immediately went in and said, it, like a couple of hours before on the uh, pre-game interview, Young Buck just straight up says, we've picked blue side. And I was like, oh, well, that's it. It's just lost now. It's just over. The game is just done. And then both solo lanes get counter picks two games in a row. And then the third game, we finally get caps on counter pick Victor and the entire enemy comp can just collapse on him for days. So it doesn't matter anymore. But uh, what I definitely always thought was that Red Side would win. I obviously predicted Fnatic. I'll always all in unapologetically on EU teams. And I have no shame in that. So yes, you got the uh, overall prediction correct. I do still uh, stand by two statements particularly one the counter pick one i honestly think counter picks would always matter more Bwipo did really well against the shy in the first game matchup for example which i actually think is uh really good for him i also think uh reckless was playing surprisingly well in the first game caps really didn't have that many options but still there was no reason for him to burn his flash at all eight minutes in literally none at all and that uh, eliminated a lot of options fanatic were opening up with their bottom lane and the second one is soaz came in and played really well on the matchup that i've always seen being atrox favored the entirety of world soaz comes in ergot versus atrox and just smashes him and it's like okay this guy playing the whole time no one would be debating whether he's better or worse on carry matchups or not because soaz absolutely showed he can still perform at the literally the final game in the world championships there's no real higher uh, sure. place to play than that so better and yourself. wrong oh, no. there you go. local right better and wrong local right that's all i can say see after all that locals just degenerated into like a redditor at this point in time. he doesn't even care about any of the reasons any analysis. Degenerated. No. all that oh, matters okay. is that he just got to say that he was right in the end there what about well, this i definitely I do well i let me let me at least give me give me a chance. Um, well, I, I was actually going to give you a point here because I was going to say that definitely Boxer was getting outperformed by Ning uh, in this series for sure. Like there was no reason why uh, Lee Sin versus Gragas. Gragas is getting the first gank off. I mean, the shy was playing uh, the first uh, the first point where Lee could have potentially ganked him quite well. But there's no reason why Lee shouldn't be getting the advantages Topside in that matchup. But Ning was somehow getting all of them. So I think Box was getting outperformed by Ning, and you were definitely throwing in a lot of weight on Ning and Baolan's performance. So yeah. I'll give you that for sure. Well, that one I actually didn't predict. I actually agreed with you that Broxa would be better, but my reasoning was Ning and Baolan just played so bad in groups, and a lot of the sure. fanatic winning argument was it's like, Look at look at them when they played in groups. Fnatic just smashed them, and that's not what happened. Like they didn't get smashed, and Ning and Bao sure. were just absolute garbage in groups, and I didn't think that would happen again. But yeah, like finals. Um, I agree. Like it was really wacky with Fnatic picking blue side 
when they yeah. didn't need to and like giving IG red side. So it was more stompy than it should have been. But even if Fnatic took red side, I still think game results would have been similar or three and one. Uh, well, I honestly disagree on that point. Like, I think the way that Fnatic drafted on Red Side versus Cloud9 gave me a lot of uh, hope for them coming into the series, obviously, given that I was mm -hmm. predicting Fnatic to win it all. Um, but I do think that the one time that they did uh, get that side, whereas they were getting strong counterpicks on both their solo lanes, they didn't play out uh, with those solo lanes correctly. And honestly, the entire composition was geared very heavily versus this Victor pick. There are plenty of things you can pick into Galio in uh, that scenario. I don't understand why they felt this obsessive need to go for the Gear Flex Victor Cloud9 did on them. That didn't work out uh, either. And I think if they had had red sides uh, more games, I think that I think I, I mean this is obviously something that you can never say for sure. I do think a mental sure. factor came into play. Roxas seemed to think that the only lane worth ganking or doing anything around was mid lane after the first uh, game, whereas he definitely top lane Urgot versus Iradia is an insanely snowbally matchup. And basically, first jungle gank will win that for the rest of the game. And he was abandoning it almost entirely. Like he could have still on his first reset gone straight top, and he would have been able to match the Gragas gank. But this just wasn't on his mind. And I do think mentality played a part after the first few losses. Given that they won the coin flip, they absolutely should have started with a strong red side draft and transitioned that into a strong rest of the game. Okay. Let's go on to the next topic. What do we right, have for us, right. Dorian? Why don't we set it up then? So what we'll do is we'll talk about some of the big name teams that made it far, and then we'll talk about how they how their tournament was, what if what you know analyze with their issues adapting to the meta, did they play above or below par? So let's just start with the teams that were in the final then. So here's the question for you, veteran. Yeah. After watching all of Worlds, was IG the best team at Worlds? Uh, I think they adapted the best over time in Worlds. I think something that really particularly did against the other team you're going to ask me about, Fnatic, is that they started matching Broxa's uh, support roaming. So Broxa was basically permanently going straight mid, not jungle, off of priority backs and even not off of some priority backs, but he was being unmatched for most of the tournament in this regard, and this was giving a lot of leverage off caps. Actually, it's actually really funny. Uh, Rookie gave an interview a couple of days before the World Finals where he said, well, Fnatic always have their support jungle going mid, so uh, let's see what happens when I get my support jungle coming mid as well. And they actually did that. They actually had, a battle land was actually matching uh, on all of these roams that Hillisang has typically been getting away with Scott Free off for the entirety of Worlds. So I thought that was a really good adaptation from them. I thought they really understood how to play against G2, though obviously, uh, I think I mentioned this last time I was on here, that uh, they were scrimming. Uh, G2 a lot in the run-up to there. So maybe you could say that that gave them an edge there, but after seeing how they adapted versus Fnatic, I think that adaptation has just been a really good thing for IG. So I think they're mm -hmm. just very smart in general. Okay. What do you think, Loco? Um, I already gave my thoughts on it a little bit. I do think IG was... I mean, IG was the best team at the tournament. I think there were three teams, potentially even four, if you want to kind of include Fnatic. But I think there are three teams that you can call or that have like a chance to be the best team at the tournament, which are KT, IG, and RNG. And KT and RNG decided to not adapt and play this weird bottom-oriented style and very mm -hmm. low damage mid lane and very utility mid lane and not putting resource into mid lane, where IG adapted perfectly to the meta. So. Yeah, to an extent. Um, I do think, though, that, for example, like you point out correctly that RNG uh, had a huge issue and they decided to come in playing to bot. But uh, IG were also doing that in the first game, for example. They did Psy on top and they played really heavily around Kaisa's spike spot lane, which is actually, like, a lot of people have it in their head that Kaisa is going to permanently be weak. But honestly, if you're parving towards bot or you're doing, like, a full clear of reds, uh, red buff, red side jungle, and then reset and go bot and you're on Kaisa's level 3 spike, on level 3, she's actually really potent against a lot of AD carries. And that's the time where you can actually win a lot of skirmishes bot side. And they were playing really heavily around this and they transitioned that into, Obviously, the, the Herald fight, at which point Fnatic uh, lost the game entirely. But I do think that they chose to do this, not because, like what RNG did, RNG pigeonholed into this, just thinking this is our style. They did this because they knew they could play this style specifically against the way Fnatic is playing the game. I thought, And I, I, I thought that's what set them apart. And I also want to add in, because uh, I specified their adaptation. I think adaptation matters a lot if there isn't a loser's bracket. 
and there's been a lot of talk about yes. there should be a loser's bracket. And I agree, if you restructure the tournament, then a different team will be crowned the best in the world. I never want to take anything away from the team that won Worlds. I, I sure. honestly believe you should treat that as they are the best in the world, because this is the game. Everyone knows it's going to be a single elimination tournament yes. a year in advance. You're preparing to be this kind of team. And IG were this kind of strong adaptive team. I think if you give everyone a, a second chance, KT may well come, come out on top. And I know that's what a lot of people, myself included, thought was going to be uh, the, the winner of this world championship. But IG are the better adapting team. That matters so much more in uh, a single elimination bracket. And they absolutely deserve to be the best team in the world. Yeah, I mean, I agree with most of your points. One thing I do want to contest on is like the Kai'Sa strong level three spike. Um, sure. It was versus Fnatic and Reckless is someone that usually yes. doesn't very contest a lot. And he was playing Jin. The big problem with Kai'Sa is when you laner into stuff like um, Lucian, I mean, most notably Lucian and also yep. Varys, even mm -hmm. though Varys didn't get seen much. I, I've been very, like, very, very strong on this mm -hmm. topic. Um, I think Kai'Sa was a very big trap pick at Worlds, and a lot of time it was a win more champion or a security blanket champion than an actual good pick that are that became like the core reason that you win. It was more of like a cherry on top, like more of an insurance policy than anything. And I think a lot of times she was a liability for most teams. Yeah, so this is rather common sentiment. This is honestly a sentiment that I was also holding for a while, but uh, thinking about it more and studying the matchup more, I do honestly think that on level three, there are very few champions she loses to provided provided that her jungler support are very synergetic with her passive. If she can get the passive proc off on level three, uh, all three abilities down, uh, she she will win that skirmish. There's, there's There are very few champions that output a similar level of damage. Luckily, you mentioned Lucian. Lucian is one of those who can incur an advantage at level two that will completely negate this skirmishing uh, mm -hmm. presence. But so long as you are going for the Braum, the Alistair, the Rakan, and what were IG going for? They were going for the Camilla and the Gragas this mm -hmm. whole series. So they were very much playing with this kind of synergy in mind. And if Reckless does decide, it was Jim Braum first game, I believe, that they were mm -hmm. on. If Jim, if he does decide to seed control, then he seeds control, then you're perfectly correct to jungle down towards bot side and you get full bot side control off of that before your first reset. And then you can match uh, Lee Sin's initial gank top, which is what they're going to try to do to snowball the game. So mm -hmm. it's going to be good either way to path in this manner. And I think that's a method of using the Kaisers more than just a security blanket that is perfectly viable. And I did just witness ID IG doing this game. Uh, I do think a lot. I think this is also this has been more successful in scrims. Playing around these types of spike and playing around these early spikes has been more successful in scrims uh, for a lot of these teams. And I think that might be why you saw a lot more Kaiser than we would have otherwise expected. I think uh, if you run the tournament over, Kaiser play rate drops so much. I think KT, um, RNG, or KT, RNG, Genji, and Afrika all play Kaifa very, very yeah. low amounts to compare to before. I think uh, Braum priority increases, and I think... Yeah, jungle meta, I guess jungle meta was pretty second for most of the tournament. I'd honestly hazard to say that if you were to play the tournament over again, knowing what everyone knows now, Zin's priority would actually drop a bit. Um, but yeah, I think Zin's priority would actually drop a bit because I think a lot of people realize the strength of Predator Gragas. By the way, this is an unrelated point to the Kaisa point because I actually think Zin Zhao synergizes very well with Kaisa anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm trying to think of things that would potentially drop in priority. I think Zin would be one of those that would drop a bit. You actually saw him uh, get through the entirety of draft a couple yeah. of times in this uh, in the final series. So I was actually super puzzled because I thought Zin Zhao yeah. was a perfect champion in the meta. Super yeah. level strong, super level super strong level two gank yes. in team fight so very functional later on because of the ultimate like ultimate being his ultimate is you knock everyone yeah. away and everyone outside the circle cannot do damage to you like he yeah actually then i this in the middle so well i was like just super shocked yeah. like neither team were picking Zin Zhao or prioritizing Zin Zhao because yeah like he has so much success throughout the tournament i'm i'm just what the hell happened in the week of then then I saw the insane tempo that Ning was getting on the Talia pick and realized that there are other picks that are able to incur significant advantages early on other than Zin Zhao and then can be more useful later on in a, either 1-3-1 one one setups, which was basically what the tournament was tending towards, these 1-3-1 one one setups. And another champion that's giga good in these 1-3-1 one one setups is Gragas. For a completely different reason that Talia is, completely different reason, but is still, like Talia you're going to use to collapse, Gragas you're going to use to secure a free man. And then I saw Ning one-shot two people on first back with 
with Gragas, and I was okay, now I see why this champion is so giga prioritized. And I think you'll see more of these pickups, not that Zin is necessarily weak, but that there are actually a lot of other champions that were very good to prioritize given the play style teams were going for, and I think those would get picked a bit more. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I mean, on the IG topic, like there's one level on which I think it would have just been more satisfying for IG if they could have at least played Royal Never Give Up in the semis and beaten them because we have the mm. track record that they'd lost before. So that would do a lot better job of showing that, you know, they'd changed and the, the meta was different. But at the same time, you can't really talk shit on a team that did beat KT Rolster, the number one group mm. in seed. Like, at the mm. end of the day, what was stopping KT Rolster swapping how they played the game? They had, they had the pieces to play through top lane. They mm. didn't do it. They obviously didn't think it was the best way to play. So I think, yeah, I yeah. agree with you. You have to give it up to IG and just say they're the best. Even if there's like, what if it was a double limb or what if it was like yeah. a different meta? Sure, that, that's all great, but it wasn't. So like, that's yep. just a fun hypothetical. What about Fnatic then? Because I think on the Fnatic one, it's not okay. as clear cut. Okay, because IG won the tournament. IG did beat KT Rolster. IG got through all these different teams. The problem I have with the Fnatic one is when you look at it, Right, they had IG in their group, so that's pretty good. You beat the team that won the tournament yeah. in the group, that's solid. But you actually look at their playoff run now, EDG, not a team anyone expected much from. Surprising they actually get Cloud9 in the semis, you would have thought it would be a freaker. Yeah. What do you think of a, a Fnatic at this tournament? What, what's your kind of takeaway on them? Uh, so for the same reason why I would never want to bash on the world champions, I also would never want to bash on the second place team because if, who would you be replacing Cloud9 and EDG with? Uh, in these senses, like uh, they beat the team that beat the Freak of Freaks. Let's so, put yeah. RNG or KT on the other side. Let's put RNG or KT on. Well, RNG could lose to G2. I could definitely believe they would lose to Fnatic. That's the thing. Okay, and then cool. you say, so KT would be the interesting one. KT would be the really interesting one. Uh, and KT is the one everyone will jump on for the loser's bracket argument. And even every argument Foreign just made of like well, the hypotheticals that people would be saying on it are all essentially loser's bracket arguments. But I think if KT were on the other side, that they are the team that is best placed out of all of them to be Fnatic, yes. Uh, they do have this uh, tempo issue that I don't actually think Fnatic have. Uh, and it is the issue that ended up costing them versus IG. So I do, whereas I do think they, that they have a better chance than either Cloud9 or EDG, because quite frankly, they are able to match Fnatic's individual players in more areas. Uh, I still don't necessarily think that's like a surefire slam dunk for KT, particularly because even though Caps had issues versus Rookie and even versus Scout, I... I, I question whether he would actually have as many uh, issues versus either mid laner that KT would potentially choose to play, to be honest, given how they were playing for most of the tournament. That being said, last thing I saw from them was versus Rookie, so. I think KT versus Fnatic would definitely be super interesting. I, I think one thing that might happen if KT plays versus Fnatic is because Score is a very good early game jungler in terms of matching Broxa. And if Brock stuff figures, hey, I can't be ganking as much early versus Square because he's always near to counter. And the game, I think KT versus Fnatic might turn the game into a completely different kind of matchup than we've seen before, where the games are actually going very, very long and we're getting like 40 minute games or even 50 minute games. It would have been a very interesting matchup to see because I think both teams would have like been more willing to scale into each other, where Fnatic does play a lot of early game, but KT could have matched it and it would have been ended up as more scaling. And I think in like a longer game, in a more macro oriented game, KT probably would have won that. Ugh, it's, it's. I see, I actually don't necessarily like uh, KT's macro too much. Like I think that they understand fundamentally how to play around their lanes once they're on the map, but this tempo issue is a huge issue for me. That their, their, their refusal to back on tempo, they are permanently mm. overextending on plays like this. Mm. This is something that teams in Europe have by and large been fixing ever since G2 lost the Flash Wolves. That was basically the point at which everyone realized, okay, we're playing for backs because that's basically how Flash Wolves beat G2 in the IAM. They just played for backs. This was the great imported theory that became very mainstream. A couple of teams already doing this. Probably was always talking about this on H2K, for example. But uh, but this was what really brought it kind of mainstream in Europe. And I think that would have been the main advantage to have over KT. The thing that worries me about KT is that I think versus Fnatic, they may have decided, instead of what they decided versus IG, that they can actually play through their solo lanes. 
That's mm. the thing. Because what really lost them against IG was they seem to have given mm. up on this idea coming into the tournament. They were very much, as you say, trying to play through the Kaiser rather than using her as a security blanket kind of deal. But they oh. weren't even doing that properly. They were they they were essentially abandoning their solo lanes to do so. KTR are a team that have the absolute capability to play through their solo lanes. They, they have SMEP. Of course, they can play the top like every other team. Uh, in what well, every other team that got to the top four uh, had been doing the whole tournament. And I think maybe versus Vantage, their game plan changes up and they actually do default to that and they actually do do some serious damage as a result. Okay, so for like the tempo thing, more accurately, you mean them not resetting things even when they have gold and when they do have tempo advantage, not that they can't build tempo, right? Because that's what I'm Yeah, no, thinking. no, no, yeah. So yeah, they don't, they don't back on tempo. It's not okay. saying that they don't get tempo. They get tempo and then they overextend on that. That's why mm. I was really keen in saying the overextend point. So they, 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 these are the kind of teams like, okay, so for everyone watching, in your solo queue games, whenever you guys win a team fight and then you guys push for like the inhibitor and the enemy respawns and aces you, that's what KT do all the goddamn time and it's really annoying if you're a coach and watching it happen in front of you because you know that just you just need one person to shout we back and everything would have been fine kt do this all the time and yeah. this was honestly the thing that caught them out versus ig because ig understood this because ig are in the same league as rng who mm -hmm. have also who were basically the best team uh, last year, I, I honestly think at lane setups, and that was something that really carried them through this year into so many victories until they met G2. So I actually, Doran, do you have a, do you know how Korean head coaches work? In what sense? In like oh, what role they provide? I've heard of this. <laughs> I mean, I've heard that the head coach is more like design the practice and like discipline people. And then it's like the, what we would call an analyst is the strategic coach is like the coma type guy, right? So head coaches are traditionally um, more non-gamers and they're more like directors. So head coach in Korea, the role they fulfill is disciplining the players, like setting the culture and keeping the coaches responsible and keeping the players responsible and making some roster decisions. But I would say their biggest role is being a middleman between the team and the front office, like getting the team like the kind of resource they need from the front office and also okay. keeping the front office happy with like the teams. They're actually very not like strategically proficient. And the only head coaches that I can remember from Korea um, that really stand out to me as being strategically proficient recently are Goma and Nofei and the new Griffin coach. Um, holy shit, my mind, can, my mind is blanking. Um, CV Max. Yes. So, <clears throat> Dopa's best friend. <laughs> A lot of head coaches now, like a lot of the coaches, like actually doing the strategical coaching for Korea, right? And we tout Korean coaching as like, oh, the best, like Korean culture and Korean coaching. Korean coaches and actually the people that do strategies, a lot of times are incredibly new and incredibly inexperienced. They probably have a year in coaching, maybe two years in coaching. Um, and we always think of career coaches as doing really good, but the people actually doing like the lot of the strategy part, I feel like are sometimes behind North American and China or even European coaching. It's just the name and like we think of Korean coaching as being really good. It's the Korean culture and the Korean system that's really good, not the actual Korean strategical coaches. I think there's very few standout good Korean strategical coaches, but Korea overall doesn't have the best like strategic yeah. coach, the best X's and O's, you want to call it. They have the best system and the best coaching culture overall, <laughs> but I don't think their strategy is far beyond. Yeah, so, so most... Oh, no, go on if you still have something to say. Oh, I, I, that's why I wanted to say regarding like the KT thing. I think KT is a very player-run team. And the they're a modern-run team. Yeah, they're a modern-run team, definitely. And that's why they're... The tempo issue that you mentioned, or not the recalling issue that you mentioned, that's why I don't think there's like a strong coach to be and force and like set the players down and be like, fix this. Yeah, so on specifically talking about KT, then uh, when it comes to Matter, okay, well, let's specifically talk about Matter. Matter uh, has brought this problem with him from, and this is blasphemy to say, from Samsung White, who are not the most perfect team in the history of mankind, by the way. And one really obvious thing you can go back and watch in the VODs, look where they take vision, then look where they play. Because it's the opposite half the time, by the way. Yes. Uh, this tempo thing was very much an issue that 
uh, existed on Samsung White. This was an issue that existed on Matters LPL teams, and this is an issue that exists on KT right now. And this is definitely all, like every single team Matters being on, he has always ended up being like the strategic coach for them. I know for a fact that he was a strategic coach uh, on his Chinese teams, for example. He was basically brought in for that specific purpose. And everybody knows that he was like the, the main leader over at Samsung White. It's still mm -hmm. definitely the same, the same case. I don't know anything like inside information for KT to say that's so, except that I'm seeing the exact same problems he's always had. On mm -hmm. Loco's point, basically anyone who has ever read anything I've ever written expects me to just say, I agree with you. So instead, I'm going to say, I've seen it. I've seen every single coach that's being imported from Korea be complete garbage. Like mm -hmm. they are, they, they are, no, no, no. Okay, ex okay, you, you're going to say except for you? Because no. basically, we had, we had, we have, we have had coaches imported into Europe from Korea, and they are insanely overhyped. And very often, they have contributed to deep-seated issues within the team. I recommend everybody go and read uh, Dejoko's article on his time and vitality, and tell me mm -hmm. that that is worth importing a coach for. I, there, there are there are plenty of other examples that I can think of, and I can think of a couple in North America. Uh, but I assume that you want to jump in, so I'm not going to mention any names just in case you're about to mention one. Okay, I mean, uh, there's definitely cases of Korean coaches failing in North America. I think the Korean coaches that are, there's, I don't want to speak ill of all Korean coaches because I think that would be false. And there's definitely good standout Korean coaches that are like mm. incredible. I think Nofei, Reaper, Gomal, I mean, <laughs> to even me to an extent, I think like our strategic knowledge coming from and playing. You're gonna say. <laughs> uh, sure, I, of course <laughs> I'm going to say it. I mean, I played the game for four or five years on a high level. Like mm. I know the game very well. I understand players very well. I understand like how to coach and like how to give information to players very well. Like, of course, I'm not going to downplay that. I yeah, fight the myself. comments. <laughs> fight the comments, Loco. Okay. But um, Korean coaches coming over to North America or Europe are at a huge disadvantage to succeed. And I think it's not a good representative of what Korean coaches are. I'm saying both things. I'm saying Korean coaches are overrated. And you're also underrating Korean coaches because you're judging them from how they do it Europe and North America. The culture they experience, the players they experience, the language barrier they experience, it's incredibly hard for them to succeed. I think even if a good Korean coach went over to Europe or North America, it'd be really hard to succeed. For example, Coach Kim, who went over to Dignitas, mm -hmm. got kicked out of Dignitas, um, went and coached uh, King Zone, had success with King Zone, and then went over to China and then coached IG and won worlds with IG. So this coach absolutely flunked in North America. He was on Dignitas, like yeah. they were struggling. Like I think they've got relegated. Like they were just absolute fucking garbage. And mm -hmm. I actually got to talk to him and he was very smart and he was someone that actually knew players well. And he was also someone that was good at the game, but he just could not deal with um, some of the Dignitas culture and the players they had. And then he asked me for recommendations for a new AD. So I told him, um, well, double lift is available and he's someone like that's really good. That's currently not playing. This is when double lift took a break. And he's like, oh, how can I get this double lift person? And I realized he has no idea on like who North American players are or who even double lift is. And yeah, like he was just so lost in like the scene because yeah, there was no way he could have done well in North America. And I don't think that takes away any kind of credit from him being a good or a bad coach. I definitely think culture plays a part in it to move it to a neutral battlefield. For example, the way that OMG's uh, super team, uh, the UZI cool go going super team uh, mm -hmm. back in the day was handled by their Korean coaches was terrible, but that was definitely coming from a position of this may well have worked in Korea. They definitely weren't contributing that much to uh, in-game things, but for example, uh, when there was a... I'm not going to mention specifically who, but anyone who knows anything about the team can probably guess when there was a really huge fight between two players who are really known to fight in that team and have done for all the years that that team has been there, their response to it was to immediately split them into separate rooms, for example. Mm -hmm. And this is not... Like, OMG got good because they had all of these kinds of arguments and they always ended up learning from them, more or less. But they were like, we, we can't have any of this kind of dissent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do agree to an extent that culture plays a part in it. Uh, I don't think that culture means that you can decide to allow borderline player abuse, though. And there have definitely been examples of uh, imported Korean coaches that have that have overseen this kind of thing. I, okay, and that's I'll... definitely not to say that European players uh, or European coaches... 
so to speak, are like perfect by any means. Mm -hmm. But definitely nobody should be thinking that no organization, and I'm definitely worried about this because franchising is coming in. Mm -hmm. And what happened with American franchises, everybody spent their teenage kiddie money on whatever they had in their head to be the best. Do not get it in your head that it is an instant fix to, to import Korean coaches because some <laughs> horrible things have occurred as a result of that. Okay, so in terms of Korean coaches abusing players, when I was a player in Korea, like my coaches hit me. My coaches physically hit me and it was pretty normal. People got hit all the time in StarCraft. I'm not saying it's okay or I'm not saying it should be allowed, but it's completely culturally normal for older people to hit to younger hit people. <laughs> 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 but it's culturally it yeah. completely normal in Korea for older people to hit oh, younger people. Like in high school, if you're late, you don't go serve a detention. Like what you do, it, I'll actually show you. So you... <clears throat> Oh my, we just, we just hit Reddit. And then they'll <laughs> get the belt and they'll fucking smack you. They, they'll smack you. My like, is this like, I remember in high school and also my youngest brother, he recently got into college. I think he's a sophomore now. Even in his generation, I remember him complaining about getting hit in high school. So even like recent generations, like that's been a thing in Korea. And like, it's, it's been a thing for like the longest time. So. Yes, like in America, like you can't beat your kids, but in Korea, it's just so normal and so part of such part of the culture. It's like if you love your kids, like you'll beat them or they're going to turn out like little shits like veteran. Don't cut the clip there. Just want to say <laughs> definitely did not accuse any Korean coach in Europe of hitting players, by the way. I, I thought that's that. what you meant when For you said sure. Korean abuse. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. Uh, you didn't anyway, let, okay, let, let's bring it back on. Move on. So, <laughs> okay. so a lot of that was about KT and tying into that element. So let's swap over and talk about one of the other Korean teams. So what about Afrika mm -hmm. Freaks then? Because this is the team where, for me, the biggest outlier of the entire tournament was the, the Afrika versus C9 series. That to me is like so, some episode of the Twilight Zone where something <laughs> happened in that game. It went one sided as fuck to C9. And then I don't, I didn't see the same C9 before or after. I didn't see the same Africa before. It's like, I don't, I, I've never seen anyone give a good explanation as to why this series is so bad, despite the fact Loco and Ellis have tried for about two hours collectively. So, <laughs> so, veteran, what's your take on this angle, the Africa Freaks team? The Africa Freaks team. Okay. All right. Well, I do think they came in playing the wrong style. I, I do want to correct uh, one thing on the KT thing is that they actually picked properly if you are going to play around Sirlians, but they right. didn't. Afrika didn't even pick properly. Um, and they came in uh, to... They came into the championship with the wrong idea of the meta, and they got severely punished for that with Cloud9 in the weirdest way possible, because Cloud9 there didn't necessarily have the best idea of the meta in some of those games either, because these guys were permanently playing around bot lane as well. It's just they were matching the skirmish with picks like Lucian, for example, which are oh. always going to work better. Let me interrupt yeah. you for a second. So in Reaper's interview, or not interview, Reaper's stream with Lust, yeah. um, I watched a little bit, and he was saying, I, it actually explains so much. So, um, so C9 belief was hit level two on junglers, take crap, and fight with your support and make sure that support is Brom and you're under. <laughs> huh? Yes, I love it. No, I love I, it. But that's exactly what it manifested on my screen. <laughs> like, and that's what they like. That's that was their belief, and that's why they so highly prioritized Brom. And it actually explained a lot for the Africa series and for the mm -hmm. Fnatic series because they were always first rotationing Brom with like a strong yes. level two jungler, and that was their oh. belief. And that's like what they <clears throat> executed well versus Africa. Like, pick Brom, pick a strong early game mm -hmm. jungler, and take those early skirmishes near crab. Yeah, so the scuttle, the scuttle is the big thing here. And uh, Fnatic understood what the scuttle change the first two weeks of uh, some of truly meant. And they are one of the teams that was best situated to adapt to that. They actually were heavily prioritizing Braum all year. And this really worked for them when uh, Scuttle ended up changing the entire meta the way that it has. Uh, and so it's uh, it's really good to see that Cloud9 uh, came in with that kind of mentality because that meant that around bot side particularly, they were going to win every skirmish. And the thing is, everything was decided to happen around bot side because Afrika didn't know how else to play the game. They could have avoided this. They could have avoided this. And if they end up avoiding this, what they would uh, end up seeing would hopefully be Cloud9 do what Fnatic do, which is transition their bot 
spot lane pressure into mid lane pressure. And basically that, that was the story of Fnatic's side of the bracket. That was always how they wanted to play. They would prioritize these uh, bot laners that could push. They had the Sivir, they had the Jin, and then you had Hillisang mostly on Braum, maybe on Alistair, maybe on Wakan. And they would just go mid and Caps would get ahead. And this was this was the game plan. That obviously didn't manifest every single time, but this was the game plan. Cloud9, the Cloud9 of Freakers, uh, Freak series was just pure skirmish spot. And I'm really happy to, to hear that Reaper literally planned for that. Probably though he may have thought it was like a blanket blanket way to play the game at this point, which would be wild. It wasn't it wasn't just around Africa C9. He mentioned yeah, okay. both worlds about yeah, hey, this is was this was our read on the game and this was what we thought we should be doing. You can pick Kaiser if you're gonna do that, I will say. Uh, nice. with those two picks, by the way. Honestly, you can pick Kaiser, but the problem arises is when the enemy the duo picks something like All of Star Lucian, you can't sometimes like due to how rough level one and level two is. You can't even lead to go to Scuttle without missing a lot of creeps if you're pushing yeah, no, all the way. Lucian, Lucian level two will win, uh, yeah. for sure. Uh, like also, the bomb, the bomb isn't going to be a significant factor. Lucian, yeah, but Lucian's made a lot of um, improvements where they started taking um, Mana Flow Man and taking W level one, where it was like W level one. Yeah, W. Then level your level one. two is not going to be anywhere near as potent as it would no, no, be no. with a Q stop. Well, thing is. Um, you can build the wave and you can hit level two first. And W is actually only five damage off from Q, and it's much easier to hit at level one. If you just compare the level ones, right? W is yeah, only yeah, five damage level. off from Q, and it also gives you movement speed whenever you hit people. So actually, at level two and level one, W ends up being a better spell than Q because you can hit W no matter what. It's a very very easy skill to hit, and you threaten them like with your passive and walking yeah. up, and they can't ever trade you. So yeah, like I could Lucian's made significant improvements by taking W level one, and with that change happening, like Lucian became better overall, and people were able to abuse early game much more so. I could potentially see if you thin the wave properly, but if you're versus a Braum, this is going to have a significant disadvantage over the QE spike uh, on level two. Anyway, even irrespective of how you're going to be able to manipulate the wave if it's honestly that potent. But you're going to be able to have the wave in your favor regardless, so I'd still honestly go QE straight up. I, I can see the logic. Versus Braum, I would still recommend going QE. Uh, and then on level 2, you will just still straight up win the lane regardless. Uh, but I, either way, either way, point is Lucian is definitely a viable pick into this. I don't necessarily think you have to be so worried about Zaya like mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these teams were. That being said, Zyra Khan, level 6 onwards, is still going to be the absolute monster oh. that you don't want enemy bottling to have, so... Oh, I Touching a little bit on champion design recently from Riot, like, both, I think, Zaya and Kai'Sa, like, these incredibly strong ADs at World, like, their damage is so back and loaded. I don't know what the hell Riot was thinking in terms of design. Like, there's so little clarity. Like, Kai'Sa is, like... Little damage, little damage, little damage, little damage, passive proc, boom, shitload of damage. Zai mm -hmm. is the exact same, like, little damage with feather, little damage with feather, little <coughs> damage with feather, e pool, like, 500 damage, like, oh man, so much, like, all these new AD champion design have so much back loaded damage, and it's very, mm -hmm. very confusing to play with at some of the times, because usually you're used to, like, equal or, like, upfront burst from ADs, but it's now completely different where it's like, back loaded damage where you feel like you're not taking a lot of damage and then you instantly melt. I agree with that. I also think uh, a huge thing, though, is that whereas previously the complaint was that we were getting too much mobility creep, I think now we're getting loads of utility creep uh, because Kaiser should not be allowed to dive your backline with 600 health shield on a free item spike and instantly delete someone. But she can uh, because of utility creep. Zaya well, should not be able to five-man stun everybody on your team uh, or be a, any sort of follow-up CC at all, but she can. Uh, and I think this uh, utility creep is kind of the bigger issue. Like, I mean, God, God damn it, this company released Ornn. I mean, <laughs> the thing, thing is, like, they design champions with certain set of rules. Like, ADs are not going to be allowed to do certain things. ADs are not going to be allowed to do certain things. ADs can be good at this. ADs can be good at this. ADs can be good at this. And then they designed, like, 10 champions in each, each role that way, like, according to the rules. And then when you follow the rules, and then you already have 10 champions that already follow the rules, then you're left with no design space to actually design something new, right? Then you have to start breaking the rules that you already put yeah. in place. And that's what they're doing. They're breaking the rules and giving tools to champions like they've never gave before. Like, look at Pike. Like, sure. Pike has, like, 
execute on a support that's resettable that can give gold to other people like um like <laughs> they're they're breaking their own rules and making champions while it's fun it's unique i'm not sure how healthy it is and i think it's a incredibly smart idea of riot to cut down on number of new champions yeah, no, uh, that's definitely good. I only, I only realized that recently. I think I saw a post on the Reddit front page where they were like only three new champs or something like that was released this year. And I was like, oh, I didn't even notice that until uh, until now. I do remember. You don't, it. I mean, you don't notice because old champions get deleted and new champions get added in terms of reworks. Like the yeah, yeah, new yeah. new new is not anything like old new new. The new ergot is not anything like old ergot. So mm. in a way, like you're still getting five new champions. It's just they're deleting a few champions along the way. Rest in peace, Mr. Don't Remake Aatrox. We were all on your side. Everybody was on your side. There wasn't a single person that wasn't on your side once Aatrox was actually viable. Just rest in peace, my brother. Veteran. These What's are up? the sorts of softballs I have to give you every now and then, mate. So, okay. Were you actually impressed with Cloud9's run? Or do you think that they, I don't know, they got the right bracket or they got the right opponent or whatever it may be? Were you impressed? Uh, yes, I was impressed because they are the <coughs> first. Uh, they are the first team since OMG. Therefore, arguably the first team since the start of total Korean dominance in I think any sport in twenty years to be a Korean team uh, straight up in uh, in a world championship. I think that's correct. Yes. Uh, but I may be, that is correct. correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yes, that's going to always be impressive. And I am never, ever, ever going to try to diminish that. So I have to say, yes, I was impressed by the North American team at this tournament that got smashed by Fnatic. So that's my short answer. That's basically my long answer as well. I obviously, I think that they didn't have as strong a read on the meta as they otherwise could have, but they had a stronger read on the meta than most of the teams in the tournament. Yeah. I think, uh, you were talking at the beginning of the show about like new narratives that are that are coming into play, and it's like Cloud9 basically just confirmed that they have to always make it out of groups. The only team that is allowed to deny Cloud9 anything is apparently Fnatic, uh, which they denied. They were the only time that they didn't make it out of groups of season five. That was when Fnatic was in their yes. group. And they and they beat them in the tiebreaker, no? Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. The, the three three zero week. Yes. Yeah, the three and zero they, into zero four week. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, they got out of groups in season three because they randomly had a buy. No one knows why, and got smashed by Fnatic. Right, uh, everyone so had a buy. So. Every seed one had a buy. <laughs> no, you have did, yeah, you have did not have a buy. Yeah. Was it from a dice roll or was it from like previous no, performance? It's because all they stars. didn't place top four all stars, which was it's uh, okay. debacled. It's not worth going into. Well, luckily okay, that's yeah. all people <laughs> gone now, but that was pretty stupid. Okay. Yeah. I have to say. Yeah. So, um, full commiserations to Reapers. I've said the, 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 the reason I'm not going like really heavy on Clarence because I've said all this already, but I'll just say this for your viewers full commiserations on uh, Reaper for actually all ending on this roster swap. It really would not have been possible without this. Full commiserations to the org for backing him up on this. The moment that they made a video on this, they could not go back. That was the point of no return. The moment that they made a video saying, This is what we are doing, this is us firing them for you on screen right now. There was no ambiguity for. Uh, for Jensen, for Sneaky, for Smoothie, Rift, rest in peace, uh, this was definitely it. They had to either step up and show up or they were out of the team. They were fully willing to capitalize on the ridiculous amount of junglers that they had hired. Uh, and Golden Glue, which... Uh, they only I had two I junglers. Did they have any more? They bought a lot of junglers that they never used. Uh, oh, okay. They like they actually owned Wiggly for a while, no, and they bought another jungler at the scouting grounds that year. They had like four junglers at one wow. point. Did Lula. you know? Did yeah. you know uh, that Lulex went from my Shulka team to Cloud Nine, and they never used him. These well, guys he was, had. He got picked up as a coach, no? That's what I thought. Uh, whew. okay, yeah. So I don't exactly know how much I can say. He ended up being like uh, an in-house uh, jungler coach, but like that's not the he original role he got picked up. That. He was a he was a he was he was another jungler on their roster. That's all I'm gonna say because I'm on very shaky grounds now. Okay. Um, but they had junglers for days. Like it's five if you include Lulex. They've gone through four if you don't include Lulex. They they had a lot of junglers. They 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 just picked up loads of them, and I really don't. Jack know why. is if. Jack, Jack, if Steve has less money and if he was smarter. 
But he exactly. even mentioned that they let go of contracts. Like, how many junglers do these guys need? I mean, Jack is just incredibly smart about doing things. And one thing I do want to give so much credit to Reaper is, I think if two or three games go wrong for C9, and they don't make playoffs, and they don't get that shot at Gauntlet, or they don't get that shot for Worlds, Reaper is fired this year. For, oh, benching, so, Sneaky yeah. and, for benching Sneaky and Jensen and not mm -hmm. producing results, I think Reaper was like two or three games away from getting fired to being heralded as the best North American coach. And How I would have thought... Hmm? Go ahead. Go how no, no, no. I would have thought about it in his position is uh, I'm going to get fired either way. We're either going to lose with fucking Jensen and Sneaky and Smoothie, like the best mid, the best support. This guy is normally said to be the only guy that can compete with double lift. I'm going to lose with my up and coming licorice. I have Sven Skeren on my team. This guy even knocked out my own team at one point. Like, oh, oh I, I'm going to lose with these guys, or I'm going to do the plan that I know is our only way out and then potentially get fired because we lose anyway. Like, I'm getting fired either way is how I would have thought about it in his position. Uh, so at that point, just do what you think is going to give you the best chance of not getting fired, which is going to be the plan you actually think is going to win. So I, I fully, I, I, I can see in his head why he would immediately think this is the best thing. What I don't understand is why the org thought it was the best thing, because I don't see many orgs, I don't see any orgs in North America, including Cloud9, have actually thinking, yeah, let's do this. Let's get rid of our biggest Twitter draws, our biggest YouTube draws, our biggest fan draws, at the same time as the competitive roster we've spent giga money for. So I'll always give so much praise to them for that. Because Jack is always willing to let go of players a year early than a year later, which is some things that other teams are just not able to do. I think Team Liquid got rid of Piglet a year later than they should have. Um, TSM... Hard to say. I, I I think they should still keep Bjerg. Is there any player they got rid of too late? Mm, maybe potentially Dyrus. Maybe potentially Dyrus. Maybe actually not for Turtle. Turtle was still really competitive, but yeah, Dyrus for one. Like they got rid of him a year later than they, they should yeah. have got rid of him for a year early. Like Jack yeah. is very smart about when he lets go of players. Like Hi and that crew gave Jack so much success and so much start, and I think it's a super easy trap for a lot of owners to have fallen into and been like, I can't let go of these guys. Like, they're the best. I've seen them, like, win me multiple championships. Jack was able to bench high or let go of high and pick up Incarnation. I mean, pick up Jensen. Like, he takes risky moves. And one thing that Jack also does well, Jack doesn't know Overwatch very well. Jack doesn't know CSGO very well. Jack doesn't know League of Legends very well, strategically. And Jack is able to know that and admit that <coughs> and allow people that know more about those games to run his org and run his roster, which is something that I feel like a lot of owners can't do. I feel like a lot of owners feel like, I've been in esports for five and six years. I know Overwatch, I know CSGO, I know League of Legends, and they're not able to let someone else make the decision. But Jack, as like someone that's so like enormously, hugely successful can say, Reaper knows more about League of Legends than me. I'm going to let him make the call he wants. Whoever coaches their Overwatch team, this Overwatch coach knows more about Overwatch than me. I'm going to let him make his decision. Whoever coaches their CSGO team, this CSGO dude knows more about CSGO than me. I'm going to let yeah. him make the decision. So Jack is always successful in those games because he can identify good management and good coaching talent and let them do their job. And that's, that's why C9 wins in everything. It's not because Jack knows all these games better than other owners. It's because Zach knows how to run a system better and he knows how to trust people better. Can uh, you touch a little bit on that, Thorin? I know you know a lot more about Overwatch and CSGO than me. See, the problem with that is I don't think... Maybe in League of Legends, you should have just kept the example there because in some of mm -hmm. the other games, it doesn't work quite as well. Mm -hmm. Like in CSGO, for example, they won the major, but that was like kind of like a fluke. Like they weren't mm -hmm. even, I mean, they were like the fourth best team at the time, but you know, they weren't expecting. But is he win. a meddling owner in CSGO? Uh, a little bit. As really? In, like, wow. for example, there was a player who has just semi retired now called Skadoodle. Who yeah, I know. Probably, Ska. probably should have been off that team a year and a half before. Now, mm -hmm. because they won the major, people are going to say it's justified, but I actually think it isn't. Like, I think you could have been a much better team in the other tournaments if you would got rid of this guy. And unfortunately, seemingly uh, through his own personal relationship with him, he didn't want to kick this guy. And then also some of the teammates maybe vouched him or something. So it, uh, in some degrees, I agree with you. Like, I definitely agree mm -hmm. on, the, on the angle of, like, delegating responsibility. Like, for mm -hmm. example, in games like CSGO, which is obviously my game, I've mm -hmm. had 
dozens of conversations with Jack in that game where he's come to me, what do you think of this player? Or should I, you know, should I kick this guy or whatever? And it doesn't mean he takes what you're saying and necessarily does what you want, but he wants to take as many like outside opinions as possible and then hopefully come to the right decision. So I wouldn't say it's like as clear cut as that, like from a legal edges perspective, it might be, but mm-hmm. as a general approach, I'd agree with you. Yeah. I mean, he has success in like what three, four games, like sure, absolute course, total success. Yeah. So he has to be doing something right. And I do think I it comes a lot yeah. from him just being able to step back where a lot of the owners aren't able to step back. I think his priority is actually more uh, long-term thinking than how most owners are. So the reason why I'm surprised about Cloud9 and uh, I've, I've, I've said this a few times now, but uh, the reason I was surprised about Cloud9 uh, going along with this decision is on a pure marketing basis. On a pure marketing basis, no <coughs> org thinks like this. I don't, I don't necessarily think Jack would think that by keeping Jensen's movie uh, sneaky, that he is definitely securing a win. I don't think if he had decided to do that, that that would be his thought process. I think he's securing his brand. I think that would be the thinking he would have to do to come up with that. And I've heard, for example, uh, NRG. NRG were very influential on their roster uh, in terms of Twitter followers. Like they were, they were always looking for branding. You uh, mean over... for League of Legends? Yeah. Yes. Yes, cool. they were. I mean, if you go and check that roster, you can very easily see the people that I'm talking about that they were prioritizing for that reason. I know for a fact that they were prioritizing them for the the reasons of Twitter and that the head coach didn't have any say in this. I, uh, um, well, I, this is, I, I really want to finish my thought because okay, this is a this is a really pervasive this is a really pervasive thing in North America. But I think that if you genuinely care about your brand, what Jack just did was the absolute best thing possible for the Cloud9 brand because what he did was he completely disassociated them from Jensen Sneaky and Smoothie. Jensen mm-hmm. Sneaky were their biggest draws. And there were previously a lot of people who would say that they are watching Cloud9 for Jensen, for Sneaky. Uh, if Cloud9 were not doing well, they would think, oh, Jensen and Sneaky are being held back. Mm-hmm. Uh, if Cloud9 were doing really well, oh, I'm glad Jensen and Sneaky are finally getting uh, the kind of teams that they deserve and the kind of success mm-hmm. that they deserve. Uh, what he did by benching Jensen and Sneaky and having that be the correct decision is uh, he transferred all of this pity into essentially blame. Uh, now people will hold Jensen Sneaky uh, to account for bringing down Cloud9 as opposed to Cloud9 potentially bringing down Jensen Sneaky. Right. And now if they ever, if they, if if Cloud9 ever want to win and ever make a decision like this again, in a mm-hmm. fan, from a fan perspective, the players, including Jensen Sneaky, are all disposable. Cloud9 is the team that wins, and it is not beholden to any players anymore for that. The brand has now transferred to Cloud9. Say mm-hmm. they lose Jensen Sneaky in the future off season. That is not going to damage their brand now anywhere near as much as it otherwise could have. Mm-hmm. Anywhere near as much. It's similar for why CLG's brand was actually able to uh, succeed and eventually acquired the sponsorship that they got with Madison Square Garden to stay into in the LCS they just after got lucky. Double lift. <laughs> they lost double lift. They lost mm-hmm. double lift, but they won championships with Stixo. They actually yeah. stayed in the conversation. That was they didn't make a conscious decision that they're going for a long term marketing thing. But I think if you are an org owner and your coach comes up to you and says, This is the best way that we can win, and they propose something like that, if it succeeds, you will now own your own brand and your own success. You will not be beholden to spending dumb money on certain players to keep them, to keep their branding associated with you. Cloud9 are not beholden to that anymore. They can now literally just try to build winning rosters and everybody will watch Cloud9 because it's Cloud9. And a winning roster, by the way, is not necessarily the most expensive roster. The most popular players will make the most expensive roster. The most successful players, not always, not always. Mm -hmm. So I think what Jack's done is really good from a long-term marketing point. I mean, it's what all teams want to do, like be a brand, not be like a home for players, like be your brand being bigger than player brand. I agree with everything you said of Seth when you brought up the CLG example, because CLG example was just Afro and Double kind of gave an ultimatum at each other. Like, I don't want to play with this guy. I don't want to play with this guy. It's either me or him. And CLG chose Afro over Double. It wasn't them letting go of Double. If for like uh, branding or a future reason, they were just put into the corner. And yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they I mean, to... I was sure to say, I don't think they did it for the same reason, but I think it works out in the same way. Uh, it, it, it worked out accidentally in the same way. Yes. I, I agree with your reasoning, just terrible example with CLG. 
but I have no other example other than Cloud9 to bring up. So I just brought up, look, this, these guys accidentally did it, therefore. Well, actually, <laughs> that's, that's one way I would maybe describe the difference in Cloud9 in the past and now, is that if mm -hmm. you look at where esports is right now in games like CSGO, League of Legends, you do not make any money in these games. You lose money by having teams in these games that are championship level teams. Mm -hmm. So the difference is once we got to that world, Jack has done the correct thing, which is just try and mm -hmm. make take a path that can actually make you win the championship. In the mm -hmm. past, I actually think he did a very bad job from the other end, which is in the days when you could make money from people being <clears throat> big streaming presences, big social media presences. That's one of the reasons in CSGO, for example, I know why he kept some of the core players a long, long time because his players were people like Shroud. So mm -hmm. obviously he doesn't want that guy to go as a massive streamer, you know, like that's a mm -hmm. great way to bring sponsorship dollars in when you can boast about Shroud streaming numbers as part of your package, you know. Mm -hmm. Likewise, in the past, it took him a long time to get rid of those original Cloud9 players, probably for similar reasons, you know, they were like championship players, they were very established names, you know. But the difference is now, there's not really any point trying to like nickel and dime your team now and get a tiny bit extra. Everyone who's in the game right now is losing money. So it's like, it's better to try and be the championship team because the, yeah. what you're gambling on now is in five years, you know, you have the best franchise and that's when I think <laughs> yeah. it's, worth, it's either worth your money or you sell it, you know? So I, it, yeah. I think he's adapted well to the, the current landscape in that sense. I'll give him that much. You're losing money while your valuation of your team goes sure. up to 200 million. Yes. So. You're, yes, you are losing liquid cash, yes. but your net worth is constantly going up. Yes. You're, you're, anyway. you're investing. You're, you're, you're taking a short deficit now for a long-term profit. You're just well, dumping you just some keep resources. All the equities were absolutely worth it <laughs> if you can yeah. keep it as long as possible. Yes. Right? What about this yeah. then? So Cloud9 in this tournament mm -hmm. had very up and down results. So everyone remembers they almost lost a gambit in the plane. Then they got to the group. Okay, they had some great performances. They beat RNG. They beat Vitality. They also lost to Gen G in a game. They also lost two out of three games to Royal Never Gives Up. They beat Afrika 3-0, but then they get 3-0 by Fnatic, right? With the other teams, it was, there was a lot less wiggle room. With Cloud9, as a, a team that finished top four, are they a top four team in this tournament? Oof. Uh, IG, RNG, RNG beat them. IG, RNG, KT, Fnatic. IG, RNG, KT, Fnatic. I think those are, if you play the tournament 100 times, I think these would be the top four teams if you average it out. Cloud9 overperformed. Not to take credit away, they overperformed while other people underperformed. So, okay. like, it doesn't, like, even if a David beats a Goliath, it doesn't mean the David is physically stronger. It means yes. David was able to outsmart or outwit the Goliath. Um, and that's sure. what Cloud9 did. Cloud9 had better strategic approaches and were more clutch. I think if you play the tournament 100 times, I think the four top teams are IG, KT, Fnatic, and RNG. That's uh, where you know, by the way, yeah. that that's like a, that's where you know that's a hot button issue that is just NA fans. Because here's the thing. I think if you took any well-known expert that's considered credible, most people would say... Even if G2 beat RNG, RNG is a better overall League of Legends team than G2. Now, that's okay to say somehow, but if you suggest that C9 is anything other than the top four team, you're a heretic and it's like the end of the world. So that, I don't, I'm not going to get bothered by that person. It's just people overreacting. But what's your take on it, Veteran? I mean, I, I agree, but I'm also consistent on it, whereas I never want to diminish the fact that Cloud9 are for this year a top four team. Uh, but I do agree that if you play a tournament a hundred times, I would at least expect... If you had the loser's bracket, if you had the loser's bracket, how about this? If you had the loser's bracket, I don't think Cloud9 make it through. I think KT learn from their mistake and they uh, they power all the way through. I think RNG learn and they power through. I think these two teams will uh, make it over Cloud9 if you were to, for example, immediately change it to a double LM. I think that's a better way of saying it than saying play a tournament 100 times. Because you play a tournament 100 times, there's no way that a Cloud9 uh, make it into a bracket such that KT and RNG can both go to... Uh, actually, yeah, the Freaker, the Freaker would have. Did you say a Freaker go up as well as Fnatic? Or I put Fnatic. I put Fnatic, IG, KT, RNG as the my top four. If you play the tournament a hundred times. Yeah, okay. So that's literally just not feasible uh, the way the tournament is right now. So because a Freaker would have to be one of them, and then either KT or IG. So you'd oh, well, have by to... hundred times. I mean, like tournament restarted hundred times over. It was from the very beginning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. 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 Yeah. 
Oh, one thing I want to talk about is like this year was the year of over cockiness is from over cockiness from Korea, over cockiness from RNG, over cockiness from KT. And I think it came a lot down to like few certain stubborn players and few certain stubborn coaches. One thing hugely funny about like the KT RNG situation, I think as good as Mata is, and I think as good as Uzi is, if you took their skill level down a little and you up their flexibility and mindset a little bit, I think those teams would have found hugely more success. I think both RNG and KT's downfall were because of their strongest and the most stubborn players. Uh, I think, uh, I guess, so with KT, that is the perma problem. I think it's ridiculously relevant to RNG, though. Uh, with RNG, it was definitely stubbornness. I don't know what Firefox was uh, doing in that team last year, but last year they were able to play through their solo lanes yes. properly. They were right. able to play this 1 3 1 out properly. And then this year, no Firefox, no win, I guess. I, I don't know. Like, uh, Maybe, Uzi, maybe Uzi Kesman thing, and Hart have a lot to answer to. I mean, Uzi is like... I, Uzi was on the team last year. Like, I, I did, okay, the only I fundamental know. change that occurred... Had, I, I do actually legitimately have to question if Firefox was legitimately that that uh, necessary to control Wait, Uzi. I think, I think it's so unfair to Kesman and Hart to be like, they were like worse coaches and they couldn't control Uzi. Uzi this year was a different monster. Win All-Stars, win Spring, win MSI, win Asian Games, win Summer, you win all that, then your ego gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Everyone like, on that team uh, won all of that, though. That's I, the everyone, thing, like. everyone did, but what if it... I mean, if you are winning all that and like you have like an extremely strong-minded player, don't you think that player doubles down on his beliefs and it becomes harder and harder to change? No, I mean, the coach needs to double down as well. The coach also won all of these things. Why can't his ego be increasing in the same manner? Or why can't his confidence, is a better way to put it, be increasing in the same manner? Like, I, this is the fundamental change. Potentially, yes, but I think... Look, Paul, I've got to call you out on this. Okay. Right, so let, let's just consider for a second. You just said it okay. yourself. They won everything this mm -hmm. year. They won literally all the LPL splits. They even won the Demacia Cup, not even using Uzi Eye and still won the motherfucker. They won <laughs> MSI. They <laughs> sent most of their team to that Asian Games and they won that. Mm -hmm. Then they come to Worlds. They didn't even do badly in the group. Okay, they lost one game to Cloud9. Cool, they still won two out of three. Still mm -hmm. won the fucking group. They lost one game to uh, Vitality as Vitality. well, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, so okay, they got mm -hmm. upset once or twice. Mm -hmm. And then they've just lost immediately in the quarterfinals and even then in five games. So it's like... Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like there was a massive sample size where they fucked up. It's like they basically just didn't adapt in a couple of games. Oh, yeah, they, they didn't adapt in the most crucial of games. And, sure. Uh, That's all I, well and good and sane, mate. When have, when's everyone else doing that? My point isn't... Uh, my point is, it's extreme. it becomes harder and harder to control players. Like, it becomes harder and harder to control players. Yeah, but my point in this scenario is, winning it makes sense. Winning. It makes sense they wouldn't need to be controlled. You win in every time. What about that story you saw on Reddit where like they'd won forty scrims in a row or something? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. in their mind, what what the mess the universe is sending you a message. You no. almost can't lose. You, you mm -hmm. might. You can't lose. Everything you're doing is right. You know what? You guys that's, are geniuses. That's the most you have dangerous, to that. That's it the is, most dangerous but, place to be, like where you feel like you can't lose and where you feel like you're doing the right things. Like sure. and that, that is the single most dangerous mindset to have as a team. I think RNG would have benefited a lot from early failure at Worlds. Like, not enough failure where, where they get knocked down, but sure. enough failure where they have to rethink things. Well, the I best example is Samsung last year, mate, where they mm -hmm. almost, like, fucked up the group and then in doing so, seemed to actually figure out what they had, what would make them win, you know? Yeah, I mean, when you keep winning, like, why change things? When you keep winning, like, ignore all the, what is it? Ignore all the little voices in your head. Like, sure. things might go wrong. We might have to rethink this. Maybe we aren't playing the right meta. When you're winning that much, it's really, really hard to like yeah. look at yourself and actually like change the problems and especially bring it up to like everyone that you're involved with. Like when you're winning so much, hey guys, like we might actually have to change things up. Hey guys, like we might like sure. not be doing the right thing. Like it becomes harder and harder to bring that up. Like oh, winning is great. Like, I'm not taking, I'm not saying it's bad when you win. It's just when you're winning, like the more you win, the easier it gets to lose. <laughs> it's, Maybe it's, maybe I'm not explaining it. The, maybe I'm not explaining it the best. No, I'll give you an example. Okay. Fine. 
I mean, I can give a really good example. Yeah, go I, was, I was on the 10 0 Schalke team, the only team that ever went through Challenger Series flawless. And yes, a lot of the players got really cocky. And yes, that really fucked us over the moment that we had to transition to LAN. One of our players was uh, at his first ever LAN, and that obviously uh, was going to harm his success. But this was a bunch of factors that I wasn't even taking into account because I also allowed myself to get over cocky with the team. And I also thought the universe was telling me that, you know, we, we are going to, to win for sure. I thought that we could potentially change up our playstyle for there and try to test a few things for the next split. I didn't consider the fact that one of our players was going to be doing the first land of his career. Because again, the, the universe is telling me that we were going to win versus everyone. And I take that upon myself. And I'd expect the coach of fucking TSM, who had always had free North America, to understand that when they got to the World Championships and everything wasn't free anymore, that that's not the time to get drawn into over cockiness, especially after all of those times. That's the time where definitely you have to make a legitimate difference. Dude, how, we came off of that, how, how we came off of that 10-0 split is like one of the biggest regrets of my life. And I think that these coaches should absolutely be looking at themselves and be thinking, okay, if if it is like you say, and everyone just got over cocky in there, which is a perfectly legitimate thing that could have happened, sure. if potentially they took that, yes, the universe is telling us we cannot lose, then, and somehow, by the way, losing to Cloudline Vitality wasn't the shakeup that they needed, uh, then that's still on them. They are the ones that have to steer this ship no matter how hard it gets to steer, and no matter how cocky the crew is getting, even if they're fucking throwing oranges during scrims because they're having such a good time there. I, like, that's definitely on them. I definitely take a lot of uh, the blame for what happened on Schalke. I think the coach of... Uh, all the coaches of TSM, by the way, should also consider that they maybe weren't looking completely objectively when they got to the world stage or MSI or I can't sure. remember all the tournaments I, you guys fucked up. There was, a, there, was a, there was some IEMs in there yeah, as well. I am, I am San Jose. It's incredibly humbling experience and also it's yeah. incredibly hard to know and change before you have that humbling experience. Sure. I you know. know, though, that is actually a trend that is missing in esports with these teams, though. The idea that they let, like, the especially if the coaching staff gets drawn into it. It's one thing if it's a player, you know, he's winning every game. I get why a young player would think that he's the best. But you do know, like, if you look at some of the best traditional sports examples, mm. so, like, a great example in the NFL would be Bill Belichick of the New England Patriots. Mm. It's very famous, right, that he is just as critical if you make a mistake in a game you win as in the game that you lose. He doesn't just like say, oh, you won the game. Well, don't worry, we won the game. I'm sure it'll be fine next time. You wouldn't do that mistake. <laughs> like for people who are Europeans, uh, the great example would obviously be Alex Ferguson of Manchester United. It was very famous that even when they were winning the, the Premier League, if there were people who fucked up in the game, he gave them what we used to call the euphemistically the hairdryer treatment, which is where you're just screaming in the guy's face so much you could be drying his hair off. It's like these guys are legendary for that. And the whole point I'm making here is these are teams that like have won again and again and again. And it's like they didn't get really good and go, right, we're awesome now. So don't worry. We can't do anything yeah. wrong. Like everything's perfect. What these guys understood was the mistake that you catch now before you lose stops you, your loss coming quicker than it needs to. Like rather mm -hmm. than running into that problem where you don't play well in the game and you do that mistake, it's like if I can fix even half of it now, maybe I don't have to lose this next game and then I lose two yeah. months down the road. You know, it's like, it, it, obviously, by the way, it's so easy to say it. Like that's, everyone would love to say that they'll do that approach and you have to be a very special type of coach that has your play players on board to be able to maintain that like i don't know that you could maintain it forever but it's there's, mm. there's a clear difference i think in mentality there yeah, i mean it's, it's a constant fight and you have to be very involved uh and i definitely have to say that like for those the thing is those 10 games were literally my first 10 games ever as head coach like i i literally didn't lose my first regular split as a coach was there a part so of you that was just like was a... shit this coaching stuff's fucking easy i always knew it secretly <laughs> was you know i always knew secretly i was the best coach ever <laughs> But he definitely was. I was sat there thinking like, oh my God, this team is like the most legit super team ever. I basically okay. did my job before the season began. I can put my feet up. It's all lit. Like real competition won't hit until like top five. Oh my God. I remember really distinctly Wonder did, uh, Wonder did an interview before we uh, were going to go on stage uh, for the for the promotion tournament. It wasn't even the promotion tournament. It was just the, the Challenger Series playoffs and he already put us as a top five team in LCS and it was like the whole world okay. is like saying this and you legit like I mean the, the, the mental factors I didn't even like I, I sh they were like in the back of my head you know and I should have considered them fast like I should have I should have I could have 
with the resources that I had there, legitimately uh, force some form of like sports psychologist on them already at that point. Like there were a series of things that I should have already been prepping for, knowing that now the entire environment was going to change. Going from online to LAN is a huge difference, and some people on there weren't prepared for it. And there were a series of things I should have been thinking of that I wasn't thinking of. Uh, and if I'm going to feel about, bad about stuff like that, then fuck you, Kesman and Hart, your hacks, and you should feel bad about it too. Because you definitely, like, they actually had wake up calls. Like, the Cloud9 Vitality games, how mm -hmm. could they not think, oh, yeah, we're definitely going to roll over G2? That's the second seed North America. It's not you, the sexy. It's the third seed North yes. American team I, the, beat you. Yes, the third seed European team can beat you because mm -hmm. Europe's just better than America in every role anyway. So I, I don't understand what uh, there, there's no excuse there. And these guys have been uh, professionals for years and years. Let me explain a little bit. So I know Ketsman personally because he was head coach at Blaze, and my coach, um, Coach Gong Hyung Jung, was on air, was head coach of Frost. But I also interacted with Ketsman a lot, and um, I, I'm not as good friends with him nowadays because I rarely visit Korea. But I used to hang out with him a decent amount in back in Korea. So Ketsman is a very like player coach, and he's someone that protects his players a lot, and like. A lot of times, like kids advice when um, teams did lose past in the past in Blazes, I still believe in you guys. I still think you guys are the best. So he's really good in terms of keeping players' emotions up and keeping players involved. But he's not a very good um, kick up the butt. He's very good about getting the buy-in, making sure everyone feels included, and making sure like, hey, I want to play for this coach. But he's not a very good punisher or someone that punishes players and i think a lot of their success this year was getting uzi's buy-in and getting everyone's buying and playing as a single unit and there's limitations that come with that and there's also benefits that comes with that and the benefits and the high points were winning five out of the six um most important tournaments of the year and uh Negatives that come with that is not being adaptable and not being able to punish players hard and not being able to change and change on change whenever they needed to and adapt where they needed to and do badly at worlds. So it's it's hard to be a perfect coach. I feel for all the coaches out there. Yeah, but you should aspire to uh, to perfection, no loco. You should you should definitely aspire to perfection, but there's perfection. We have that on record, LS. You're welcome. <laughs> there's perfection you can reach, and there's perfection you can chase, and without it being possible, like perfection where there is little variables and a lot of it is just honest on yourself, then you can strive for and achieve for perfection. Perfection where there's so many variables and so many things you can't perfectly control. And if you strive for perfection in those kind of scenarios where there's a lot of variables that you can't control, then you just mentally torture yourself. I, it was also, I just, an, uh, yeah, go on. <clears throat> well, I just always think that uh, the reason you should strive for perfection in general is because if you don't, then you are going to put some arbitrary, I can't control this, when maybe perhaps indeed you I'm, can. Okay, and sorry. you can never you can never put these kind of arbitrary restrictions on yourself mm. or it will get worse. So like in, in terms of like training, right? Like maybe you can perfect something very, very basic, something that you can practice over and over again, like perfecting like uh, How are we uh, defining basic? Because like our understanding of, for example, vision control around the map right now, uh, mm -hmm. even our basic understanding of that is like leagues ahead of what it was in season three. Okay, so like, like I think you can perfect, you should very, you should very much strive for perfection in laning because laning, right, happens over and over again, every single game, and you can learn each matchup and there's low amount of variables to come with it. So you can strive for perfection and you can keep getting closer and closer and closer. But something like, Perfection in a situation where you don't have Baron or where you're put onto limited information and you have to make the perfect decision while potentially possible, while theoretically possible, trying to achieve perfection in that regard is just mentally torturing yourself and you're not going to get as much out of that practice as you would in something else. Like we have limited hours of practice, right? We have like what, six scrims on average in a day and like you can try to perfect certain aspects, aspects that you can repeatedly do even by yourself or repeatedly do in scrims, you can try to perfect, but situations that come up rarely or situations with imperfect information, if you strive for perfection, you're just mentally torturing yourself and you should strive, how can I get the highest percentage chance good play in this situation? 
I There's think some... if you end up versus somebody uh, whose team has been striving for perfection for the whole term and you haven't, those guys will out accelerate you. They absolutely will. I think the teams that mm -hmm. are, I think the teams that adopt the kind of thing you are uh, talking about are, for example, Immortals, the team that was perpetually doing insanely well in regular split and they got out accelerated by teams that didn't have that kind of philosophy. They well, got no, out accelerated. No. Oh, I mean, we're, going to, we're, we're, going, we're going to a separate direction. I'm not saying you can't achieve for perfection and you should i'm not saying you shouldn't there's aspects that you should and it makes sense to achieve for perfection because you can and you can get, keep getting closer to it but there's certain aspects of the game certain aspects in life certain aspects in different kind of sports that you can't achieve perfection in realistically and it's <coughs> impossible to push yourself in that way mm -hmm. but it's also the height of egotism to think that you know what those realistic uh, barriers are you can't know that. Like no I, one knew. Uh, no one knew how far the game would advance. A I am of sure, years but ago. we can. No one knows like, now. Okay, sure, but we can, as analysts, understand something with low variables. You can try. You can get closer and closer to perfection. With something with ten variables, it's going to be much harder. Something with a hundred variables, it's going to be much harder. Like it's not egotistical to say something with hundred variables mm -hmm. is going to be much We've, harder to achieve perfection with than something with a two or three variables. You do, though, the more variables that you knock down, find ways to group said variables into like one really distilled system, for example. And then you don't have to worry about all these variables anymore. Mm -hmm. Now you're just building on top of this uh, systemized way of getting around those variables, for example. Sure, like, I'm just saying, yeah. like, I'm just to, to, to make sure that like we're talking about the exact same thing. Like, I'm literally talking about the teams that are always going to be asking, OK, this worked. How will we improve this? Like, is there a way to improve this? We need to think critically about these kind of things. Sure. And I, I think you can, never, you can never think that something is good enough. And the problem with when you place these arbitrary barriers is you will end up at a point where you think that something is good enough. Well, that, that, at, that at is, a point. At that a is point, what will happen. At a, at a certain point, perfect, perfection is an enemy of good. And you have, tw let's say you can work on 20 things. When, while you can work on 20 things and you can try to perfect all 20, you're not going to get to perfect all 20. And sometimes you're going to have to pick three or four things that are very, very core to the game. And that will, if you improve on these four things, you'll improve way more so than if you improve on maybe other of the four things. And you have to identify what are the most important things that we can improve on that are going to help us win now and that are going to help us win in the future. And you narrow it down and you work on those instead of trying to achieve perfection in something that has so many variables and that aren't going to help you win as much compared to some yeah, things but that, that are that, going to help you win a lot more. That's prioritization as opposed to like an argument versus striving for perfection. So you won't find I, like I'm, an argument I'm, from me there. Yeah, that's, like, so that's what I'm prioritizing. Yeah, prioritize things that will, that you can achieve, you should uh, try to achieve perfection in things with low variables and things with high impact. And the more you put work in those, the more you're going to get out versus things that have low impact and that have a lot of variables. Anyway, let's move <laughs> it back to the League of Legends World Wait, Championship what? from that abstract <laughs> about learning. Right, what about this uh -huh. then? So what do you think of Flash Wolves and generally the LMS? Because obviously the LMS generally didn't do well. Two of their teams went zero and six. But Flash Wolves was three and three. They beat everyone in their group. It was only mm -hmm. losing the, the tiebreaker to G2. That stopped them from going top it. So do you have any thoughts on the LMS at, at Worlds? Super controversial comment. I don't think LMS should be a main tier region. I think it should be NA, EU, China, and USA. I think the amount of money in LMS and the amount of <coughs> infrastructure and teams in LMS is much, much tinier compared to the four major regions. LMS gets a lot of credit for Taipei Assassin and mainly now Flash Rolls nowadays. I think they have one standout teams that have been keeping up the region and keeping the region at the top where overall the depth of the region and the overall player base and the level of the region is quite low compared to the major regions. I absolutely love that this was the one time that Saw that was going to finally get international play in a meta where his champ pool is actually viable he can just pick tanks now and oh my god it's the one time that you have to play through top and they have a giga shit top laner to do that with so sword art doesn't get to show off the lms doesn't get to power through they don't even get to go to corners this time they're most successful is still going to be season five i do agree i don't see why we're treating lms like a main tier region while other uh, actual like wildcard regions that have to go in via play-ins uh, aren't being given the, the same kind of benefits. I think it's that there are a lot of... Success of Flash Wolves and success Yeah, it's of just Flash Wolves. 
But I also honestly think that Flash was like going through the play-ins in certain brackets, they wouldn't necessarily get her. I think that they, I think I, I'm not necessarily saying that like uh, Flash Wolves would not always be able to get out of play-ins or anything like this. Well, actually, no, I am. I am explicitly saying this. I'm just not saying that Flash Wolves is a garbage team. I just think that they aren't a, a team that should be solo carrying the LMS to two, uh, to two slots at the World Championships. I think LMS should be treated like any other uh, mid-tier region. They do provide some insanely good players sometimes though like Carlson is uh, an import from the lms for example like one they what one benefit lms has over on other regions is <laughs> their proximity to korea and their ability to play on sure. korean servers oh, yeah, they're able to they they can play on korean servers and they can also scrim korean teams so sure. if you're a really good team in mm -hmm. lms then you can get top tier practice in both solo queue and in scrims and Flash Wolves is able to do that, so they can consistently maintain their top tier status. The moment Flash Wolves drops off from the face of the earth, the moment they lose crucial players to China or NA, yep. I think LA is going to go. Woo! Yeah, I'm very sure that they are about to lose uh, a lot of key players anyway. I'm pretty sure DLPL is going to go on a buying spree uh, through their castle, is just the first. I'm very sure uh, the rest are all going to follow him. So I think that will be it for the LMS, and then I honestly think they should play through plans like everyone else. Oh, Doran, question for you. What's your ideal world um, group? What's your ideal world format? Uh, well, the main problem here is I'll tell you, but I will just preface it by saying that it will never happen if you know Riot, okay. and it would also be very unpopular. So for a start off, I would immediately get rid of this stupid shit where like you can't be in the same group as someone from your region, because that mm -hmm. will inevitably... By de but because it's so arbitrary, it will always make the seeding fucked up for the tournament. Like mm -hmm. it, it means that like it doesn't matter that me and you are at the same level. Like we have to be in separate groups. Like that just makes the tournament worse, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also personally have something like I, you, I, I like the, I made a group of, uh, video about this. But the number one thing you have to get rid of in Worlds, it ruins the tournament, is mm -hmm. round robin. Because the worst thing about round robin is it treats every single game you play in the group as mm -hmm. if it is of an equal value, and yet it will never be of equal value. Because mm -hmm. if my team is zero and five, and I'm playing your team in the last match for the group, and you need to get to the playoffs by losing <laughs> me. Well, then guess what? You're probably getting an easy win against me because I've already gone 0-5. I have nothing left to play for. I'm essentially mm -hmm. just given the choice of either just fucking up your tournament or giving you an easy ride. And so mm -hmm. that's why you always get tiebreakers. That's why you always get like unusual results that don't seem to make sense. So I would personally go to either, I mean, you call it the dual tournament in Korea, mm -hmm. the GSL style group. I would either go to that and I would could personally you explain do that three. Could you explain that group for it's people basically, that yeah, it's basically just a double elimination tournament inside a group. So you play two games. The winner of that game plays a winner's match. The winner of this match is then through to the playoffs. You then have two losers from the first game. They play a game. The loser of that one's out of the tournament. There's now one game left to be played, which is the winner of the loser's match and the loser of the winner's match play. And that's the second team to go through. So the good thing about it is no tiebreakers. There's actually less games needed, except I'd personally make it best of three to make it like, you know, more <coughs> hype. And then also you don't have the same factor of like, you know, the order that you play the teams in depends on what your yeah. chances are getting the group out. So, you, and, like, and crucially, like I say, no tiebreakers. So it's just a much better format, especially because when you use that format, it's very rare people will complain when they go out in that format. Whereas there's a million mm -hmm. different ways you can complain about this current format. Playoffs is a bit trickier because unfortunately league has just never used double elim unless we go back to like the MLG days or whatever. So mm -hmm. people are just so trained in their mind to not have double elim. It's not like single elimination is bad. It's just that in my opinion, for single elim to be good, the rest of the format has to be really good to make the bracket end up mm -hmm. being really good. Like I think it did hurt the tournament that you got all those good teams on the IG side of the bracket, you know. Because for all I know, maybe RNG would have made it through against something. I don't know. I can't know that. So... I think there's a lot you could do. It's just unfortunate. I think it's a lot of stuff that Riot's not open to doing. Like they have a different philosophy on it. I don't necessarily agree with doing best of three in the early stages of the tournament. I've always actually been against best of three. Uh, even when they wanted to put it into LCS, I honestly think you should do best of two because the biggest problem that I have with the best of one format, which is not solved by the best of three format, is that you are quite meta dependent sometimes. So. Right. 
uh, say that you are a so say that this tournament, for example, let's just talk about this tournament. Uh, red side, I think everyone would agree, was like a really favorable uh, side for the majority of this tournament due to the the, the, the absolute sheer presence of solo lanes. I mean, if Fnatic you could, could the, disagree with you, obviously, but you know. Yeah, obviously they did, and then look where that got them. Um, but, uh, well, look, I mean, but, uh, but for human it. teams, but for human teams, if you got, if you're getting red side this tournament, you have a significant advantage. Say that that uh, key game that you absolutely need to win occurs in a best of three scenario, but now this is your time to be blue side on the best of three scenario. You're screwed. If you're best of two and you get that scenario, then you are not so screwed as you were before. Because it's yeah. going to be, you're go, go, both are going to get one game on either side. And therefore, the fact that one side is potentially favored doesn't matter overall because, yes, everyone's going to be like, oh, well, then it's a draw. Well, then it's a draw, like, unless you are legitimately the better team and then you're going to win both sides and then you're going to get the 2 0 and that will be the win for you. Otherwise, you're not giga fucked by having to start on red side and instantly get, not start on blue side and instantly getting a loss early on in the tournament, for example. And then your game is then decided by a team that you have to play against on blue side later. Like, then, then, then the RNG of the tournament, the RNG of the meta has fucked you. But if you're in a best of two scenario, that eliminates this. And I, I, I liked it when Europe was best of two. Like, there's a tiebreaker meme with that, but I felt like uh, you weren't giga fucks if you uh, were really strong. If you were against a team that is only really strong on a certain side and you really need right. this win later on yeah. and, you know, oh, screw you, this team got the side that they want uh, for this round and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you're fighting a completely uphill battle. It's a uniqueness of league where side matters yeah. so much. Yes. I think balance has to be better around that, but I disagree with overall best of twos because like you need a clear winner and for a dual tournament to work. I would like a best of three dual tournament, like Doran mentioned, with better side balance. I do think side balance is like incredibly, incredibly mismatched in League of Legends most of the time. It's very rare where red and blue is like equal. Like, unfortunately, a lot of the factors that make Riot not consider the, some of the things I'm, we've been discussing have a logic to them. It's just that I don't agree with how it's applied. Like, basically, the logic is designed mm. for the most casual fan possible. So they don't want the casual fan to see two NA teams go to Worlds and then just both play each other in the same group. Mm. They don't want to see a, a format where it's not as simple as you just play the same way as every other year and it's different, you know. So like every aspect that I would change personally, Riot is going to naturally be against, unfortunately. Like for mm -hmm. example, I'll tell you one thing right now as someone who comes from other games that is so whack about League of Legends. It's really mm -hmm. actually, when you think about it, one of the worst features of the League of Legends world circuit is that mm -hmm. you only have X amount of slots for a region. So it doesn't matter if, for all we know, Griffin might have been the fourth best team in the world. They can never prove it because they have to be top three in their region to make it to Worlds. Nah. Now, you have to understand, that might not sound weird to you because you're from League of Legends. If you go in Dota 2, right, their qualification system is they play a circuit and then they have circuit points for the entire circuit where all the teams were playing. And then the top, let's say, top eight teams get invited and then there's qualifiers for each region. So that means in theory, it never happens. But let's say China did have the top nine teams in the world. They could have had the top eight at the circuit and then the ninth team could have qualified. And they actually could have had nine teams at the, the international. Likewise, CSGO, you could have like eight teams be European because of the qualification system we have. In mm. League of Legends, you will always have three NA teams and you will always have three yeah. Korean teams. And while that <laughs> makes the tournament in some ways, in some ways more exciting, it actually makes it a worse tournament. Like that's okay. inarguable. So Riot philosophy and one of Riot's biggest goals with competitive League of Legends was globalization. Have everyone in the world play League. And I think they yeah. succeeded in that. And their reasoning for wildcard teams and why wildcards were included in their big like um, dev post about it was, or red post about it was, to give these reasons relevance and to give these reasons like some way to shoot for worlds if they aren't yes. good enough. So there is like a valid reasoning to why Riot doesn't allow like better reasons to have more thoughts and maybe they'll change their mind in the future. But I can't disagree with their core reasoning and their core philosophy of globalization of League of Legends. I think it's fine now, like at least the regions have equalized a little bit. And with franchising, I think the West will keep catching up more and more and more. Europe definitely is paving the way. But imagine they did that two, three years ago. Oh, it would have been brutal. Like imagine they did that two, three years ago with like Koreans at their absolute dominance before like Koreans got imported. Like it would be what the top 16 teams in the world, like top 
10 of them would be Korean <coughs> teams. Top 10 or nine of them would be Korean teams. I think so franchising. I thought, right? Like last time I checked the world championships, the world championship is not the fucking charity event where like every little kid said, right, here's your participation medal, Timmy. No, let, listen, let Billy play a striker now. It's his turn. It's like, no, whoever's the best striker plays, if your shit sit on the fucking bench, see you at Vietnam or wherever you are. Like, so, you have to be able to win the game. I don't, it's the thing, mate. I'm not a game dev. I don't give a fuck. I'm yeah, trying you're to not, the best tournament. You just want the best tournament, right? Yeah. Wants the best overall growth yes. for League of Legends. So the goals are different. So the tournament. Absolutely. Yeah. My point is it's they're kind of irreconcilable you know like if you go far enough down the path riot does you're not going to have a tournament like ti because like i said in theory it could be really mismanaged in that sense you know could might not have any regions from certain aspects represented so yeah it's, it's a much trickier task than people realize in that sense i'm just mm -hmm. saying that's one of the reasons why the tournament will never look as sick unfortunately mm -hmm. I just want to say, I think franchising damages regions uh, in terms of competitive viability. So I have no idea why you're giving me that uh, shocked look when Team Liquid just spent all the money in the world and couldn't even make it out of a group with EDG in it. Okay. I mean, I think franchising maybe in the short term has damaged some of the leagues. Maybe, I mean, NA and China are the only teams, only reason for franchising and China didn't get damaged. So I think we're talking about NA. I think so China had giga influx of money already. And when they did get that giga influx of money, they were severely damaged. Everybody thinks, okay, they won the MSI. And then maybe you could say that they choked at Worlds. I don't think anyone actually says that part. What happened was they did a, they, they I'll use the teenager analogy again. Uh, if a teenage kid, if a spoils teenage brat suddenly gets given a million, he doesn't make smart investments. He spends it all on the sports car that he always wanted and he crashes it the next day. What happens with all of these uh, owners who think that they know League of Legends, but don't really, once you give them the excuse to spend as much money as they want, they will spend as much money as they want on the things they want to spend it on, which is very often very far away from what they should actually be spending it on. And you saw this in North America. Cloud9 barely changed anything. Cloud9 barely changed anything. They're not here because of franchising. They would have had this roster with or without franchising for um. sure. I the teams that did get franchising and did get the permission to spend as much money as they want all suffered. They all suffered for it. They, they, these guys do not suddenly get educated when they get money. They just suddenly get the ability to all in on their dumb ideas. And okay. we're going to get an influx of new organizations that don't know what they're doing. And God knows they might listen to the wrong people because who, how are they going to know who, oh. who is and isn't the right person? So the old, what is it, punishment for being dumb was getting relegated. Yeah. Now the now punishment for being dumb is not getting relegated. It's just what getting ridiculed and getting shit on. You still keep oh. the squad and you still yeah. are allowed to learn from your mistakes and you can make long term decisions. I think No no no, but long term what? decisions to do what? Because the thing is, it, now now competitive players aren't what you're incentivized to get. Popular players are what you are incentivized to get. No, you can get, get. I, as, you, as we talked about earlier in the show, you can make long-term decisions about like raising rookies, investing, mm -hmm. trying to disassociate yourself with just being a very, very player-focused brand. You can focus more on your brand. We're mm -hmm. pick up players that are better, not necessarily the most popular. Franchising definitely is going to be better for teams long-term. I... I just cannot disagree with that. I think franchising long term is gonna make for better leagues and make for better teams. I think the Whereas I agree that they should be thinking about this in terms of long term, if my team is always winning, then that is the brand. In uh no no orgs do not think like that. Like Cloud9 is basically the only one that has that I can see having taken an action to actually go in this direction. Orgs do not do that. When China got franchised, it, it, it like 80 imports immediately, straight up. They drained Korea. It didn't matter because Korea isn't franchised. They don't spend dumb money. They Just the best team wins over there and they get qualified. I see no reason why that's suddenly going to happen in Europe. Who, how are these people going to know what, what the best players to get are? How are they going to know? They're, they're, are, they, do, are, they, are they going to know who the best talent scouts are even? Are they going to know any of these things? How are they going to know these things? Whoever not, sells themselves best is going to get the job. They're not going to know at first, but as teams show history of success, as scouts show history of success, as coaches show history of success, they'll learn from each other and the stability that franchising has will allow teams to pick up these people where there, when there isn't a lot of stability and when you have to always keep thinking short term, then you can't always make the best decisions for two, three years in a row. I think so from, the, from a competitive standpoint, what's the benefit of that over teams just straight qualifying? What do you mean straight qualifying? From a promotion tournament, from CS to 
Tails, yes. What's the what's the competitive benefit to the region of that being the case? Over so over like relegation. Yeah. So relegation so doing franchising. So doing mm -hmm. franchising over just the current Darwinian system of the best games <coughs> LCS and the best get to stay in LCS. Because you what's, constantly what's have benefit? to make you constantly have to make short term decisions to make sure you don't get relegated. You can't invest into rookies. Yeah, but all of those big risks. You can't take huge risks because. Like when the oh. punch, when the punishment for the risk is you don't exist anymore, then you always have to go for what's good or what's average, mm -hmm. then more so, uh, then more so than what could be really good in the future. Mm -hmm. You have you to. Saw, you saw, you saw that basic. We only sent one Korean import, for example, right? Mm -hmm. We only sent one Korean import. That occurred because the vast majority of... Okay, so actually, this is a much better way to say it. Basically, every single relegation team had an import for the last few years. Basically, every single one. And every single year, Europe has sent a rookie team to Worlds, and they have at least done something. Vitality could be argued to be one of the least successful rookie teams we ever sent to Worlds. And they still... they they That match was the one that knocked out uh, the Korean team from the championship, and they took a game off RNG as well. Oh. Like, uh, every single year, we have done that. Orgs have learned that if they want to keep their roster competitively viable, this crazy idea they had in their heads that a Korean automatically made it better was destroyed by the relegation and promotion system. This is an example of that system negating this idea. This I idea entirely. But people were all in on these ideas and they will not necessarily know if that if that idea in itself and that assumption of itself was wrong mm. or if potentially they just didn't get the right variable of that one. We learned very fast because we had this Darwinian system. I don't necessarily see the uh -huh. advantage otherwise. America never learned. China China took ages to learn. Okay. I don't want to dismiss your opinion, but I don't think we should stay on this topic longer. Um, I'll say one thing and you can actually have the last word. I think the orgs would have learned anyway through long term, just playing it out over and over again, every year after year. Hey, getting mm -hmm. a Korean import isn't giving us good results. It's not giving other teams good results. It's more so about being cohesive, actually having people play with each other and actually getting imports that want to incorporate, not just picking up the next hot, flashy Korean player. I think they would have learned that over time, even in a franchising system, if say EU was franchised, let's say two years ago, but you can have the last word and then let's move on to a different topic. Uh, my last thing is that anybody who ever, because uh, I've seen this a lot on Twitter, anybody who ever tells you that franchising benefits players is completely lying, gives all powers to the orgs. Uh, now you can know that your, your value is no longer that you can keep the org in the LCS, just how many followers you give them. Continue. Okay, I'm fair point. Let's move on to the next topic. Okay. Right, what about this then? So there's not that much left about Worlds overall to discuss, but I thought one thing we should discuss is this. So Team Liquid was a number one seed. They mm -hmm. came into this tournament like people would have expected them to be a team that at least should have had a chance of the Western teams to get out of their groups, etc. Looking back now, what can you say about Team Liquid? Oh. Oof. Uh, I mean, their jungler didn't really like go completely huge at this world, but uh, Double Lift has played really well. I mean... Oh... Uh... A lot has to be said that X Smithy is permanently making worlds. I, I read somewhere that like TSM Cloud9 X Smithy have always gone to worlds, obviously, except for this year where TSM yes. don't actually make it. Uh, and a lot has to be said, uh, commiserations to him for being one of the most consistent junglers in the region. Double Lift really showed up really well. It just wasn't necessarily a bottom lane tournament. And he even showed up on Kaiser, uh, which Loco loves to hate. Uh, and they did take a game off EDG. In fairness, a lot of people say that that game didn't necessarily matter, but you know, it, it could have mattered if, uh, if EDG didn't suddenly beat KT. But um, I think Double Lift did really well. I think the team uh, still had the same issues that they had in the matches I saw uh, with them on playoffs. Uh, I thought X Smithy could have played a, a, a lot more to his level, and I, that's really all I have to say on this because I'm not an expert on like uh, the North American competitive scene, and I won't pretend to be. So I'm gonna let Loco have the floor for most of this. So for the world patch we played on, there actually wasn't a lot of changes from two patches ago, but there mm -hmm. was a lot of meta learnings and a lot of teams adapting. Right, like they didn't touch Scion or Aatrox or Urgot that much. They didn't touch these tanks champions that much. But previously, teams were playing much, much slower, actually, than and especially in NA, and they weren't focused that much on solo lanes. So TL kind of was built for that meta, and they prepped for that meta, and Doublelift made a tweet about how RNG baited a lot of teams playing bottom-oriented and playing more bottom-focused. So TL's read on the meta was very, very mismatched from 
before the tournament and going into the tournament and actually playing in the tournament. And they are a team that shines best in that meta where mid takes a little backseat, top does play tanks, and jungle and support really do play vision control and play more of a controlled game. And a lot of it is reliance on ADs and diving at level six and diving bot over and over again and snowballing that way and going into more of a fair straight on 5v5 team fight. And that's what they're good at. And that's not what Worlds was about. So they came in overrated because that seemed to be the meta. And then when the meta was not that, Cloud9 actually showed up much better than them because they were able to adapt and they could fit better to that style. So I think a lot of being overrated and a lot of um, yeah. Team Liquid's like as an org first time at world problems. Yeah, Licorice was like a huge factor for Cloud9 that I don't think Team Liquid uh, ever had any sort of answer to uh, in this tournament. So like they never had a Licorice equivalent. And I do uh, think it's kind of funny that that uh, series against the Freak of Freaks still was essentially decided by bottom lane skirmishes because Doublelift would have absolutely shined if any series was going to be determined by that sort of thing. So it really sucks. Doublelift is, Double is a yeah. better Lucian than Sneaky. I think I can easily yeah. say that. Yeah, and I, I hope people don't forget he had a good tournament here because I know he got he got a, a lot of random flack because he was put like twentieth on that uh, world's list, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people were flaming for that. But he legitimately put up a. I wish we saw more games of him. I really do wish we saw more games of him. I know, I, he would have fell into the Uzi problem. I don't think Double If would have <laughs> said not sure. don't play around bottom where he needed to say. I for his team, he, he actually even can't say that because. Due to how they were built up um, and how they played this year, Impact, the only carry that he could really legitimately play and the team could legitimately play around was Gangplank. And they could have not succeeded with Impact on Gangplank. And Impact wasn't... I'm not, I don't think he's not capable of playing carry champions. They just weren't practiced in that way at all. So if, if, even if you saw more games, it would have been the exact same shit. So what about Kane then? Because because uh, like we can go back to the Korean conversation, but like I, he seems to have a lot of good things to say about Kane, and maybe you can like tell me about the kind of impact Kane has on that team. Oh, um, I mean, I actually know. Luckily, I actually know Kane very well too. We were both on uh, Najin. I was on Najin Shield. He was on Najin Sword. I actually interacted with him a lot uh, when he first came to NA. Um, we actually talked a lot, and last year I actually got to talk to him a lot because of relegations and just being close friends. So Kane is also very player kind of focus coach and more allowing he has good directions but he gets a lot of buy-in from players and <sighs> steve's expectation with this roster was to win so kane was probably just given instructions to win and build a winning, <laughs> build a winning system so he built the winning system in na and he took it Spend to spend my disney money <laughs> I, <laughs> he built the winning system in na that works great job on his part and then now he took it to worlds and it fell apart it's really hard to criticize coaches or like talk a lot about coaches other than like the parts i know because i have no idea what the fuck goes unless you're calling korean coaches uh overrated then it's perfectly fine no that's that's once they reach america no because I, I know i know the easy. system i know the system of like how korean coaches get judged and how sure. korean coaches get picked up so i can definitely the allure that we have around Korean coaches and Korean strategy being yeah. like that, I can tell you why sometimes it might not be true because I know exactly how the strategical coaches for Korea got mm -hmm. picked up. So I think it's completely fair of me to say that. But for Kane, yeah, like build a winning system in NA, get players buy-in. He did a great job of that, took it to Worlds, and then it fell apart. I don't know how Team Liquid operated as a team internally, so it's really hard for me to give credit on that part or take credit away from him on that part. What's your sure. opinion on it? Mine on Kane? I know nothing yeah. about Kane. That's why I was asking okay. you. But uh, but because well, it was curious that you were saying that uh, you think they would have had the Uzi problem. So I was wondering if Kane would have been able to deal with the Uzi problem. That's mm. why I was asking. It's not like Daler wouldn't been able to deal with the Uzi problem. It's not like at that moment, like you, there's magical words you can talk, tell a player to change their mind completely. It's a culmination of a year of success, a culmination of year and maybe sometimes even more yeah. than a year of a certain play style. There's no magical words or no magical things that you can do in that moment to change a player's mind and get their buy-in completely to play a different style than they have been playing the entire year or for several years. It's not, yeah, it's, it's, it's also no unfortunate. Like, let's be real. If they'd have just come in and it was the same meta as MSI, they'd probably just won the fucking tournament. 
we wouldn't be saying any of this shit yeah. about them now. Yeah. <laughs> There's also that element, you know, like, yeah. which doesn't, doesn't excuse them for not adapting, but, you know, likewise for Team Liquid, in their scenario, they also could have done way better in a different manner. I mean, I mean adapt, adaptation has always defined worlds, and it will always define single League of Legends. No, adaptation general. has always defined League of Legends as a game. League of Legends as a game, out of all the top esports, it's the most fluid, fluid one. Like, what are the top esports in the world right now? Like, Dota, CSGO, League of Legends. League of Le Legends changes more than any other game. Every year sure. it changes more. Jungle well, gets changed, top picks gets changed. It's the most, yeah. single most fluid game. Wait, no, I agree with that. But uh, luckily, uh, Blessed Riot have made sure that everything in League of Legends is a single elimination tournament. So my words are, are still perfectly accurate here. <laughs> but uh, like I was going to say, last time uh, Worlds was won by Samsung, uh, and they won basically purely on a purely on adapting to each team that they were coming up against really well. And, the, and no team that they came up against was able to adapt versus the specific strategy that Samsung had prepared for them. And every single world's tournament has essentially been won by this team that other teams couldn't adapt to, but they were able to play against basically any team. And sometimes sometimes with obviously season three SKT, they were just able to brute force versus every team because they were just the best players in the world. And no one was really very smart back then. But yeah. now more than ever, it's going to be about which team can adapt the best. And if you are the kind of team that has these types of uh, players that force you to play around them, you're going to be much less successful than you were able to be in the past. You yeah. can't afford to have that kind of a uh, world well, weight on you. So like, I found it interesting that you said not even Dalo would be able to, because I'm just thinking, well, Dalo wasn't able to deal with Huni. And mm -hmm. like, I don't think Huni is going to be able to uh, get a world championship again unless he has someone who will force him to play the tank setups and uh, like, like he was on SKT briefly. He's not going to get to that high again unless he's with a coach that, that is able to. And I've seen it possible because Huni was doing that on SKT and then he oh my goes God. back to America and it was over. That but, was uh, so fucking brutal. Holy shit. I could never imagine talking to players like that in NA. Like, <laughs> like Shen is the, actually the winning matchup, but you're playing the matchup wrong and you're playing the matchup bad. Yeah. So we're going to ban Shen because you're playing it wrong. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, God damn. Why am I playing the matchup wrong? Oh, God damn. God damn. Like, I, I was like shocked. I was like, damn, Goma, hoof, you're a boss, you're a motherfucking boss. Like being able to do that too, like those kind of top tier players, like much respect to Goma and much respect to Korean culture. Um, one, ugh, what is it? One weird thing about Worlds is it tests a very different skill set than what you get tested for the inter like the entirety of the year, other than few international sure. tournaments. So. Yeah, like, I wish we had more international tournaments. I think three international tournaments or maybe even two really big international tournaments throughout the year for League of Legends <coughs> would be much better. The key thing for people who don't get it is, like, MSI sounds like it because it does have the best team from each region, but the fact that you only have the one team makes it less <coughs> actually hype. And so mm. even though I get it, again, in Riot's world, they only want Worlds to be the big one you watch every year that everything builds into. But for competitive reasons, I'd rather give up MSI if it meant you get, like, another mini Worlds, basically. Like, that, that would be way cooler. Like, I don't know, top two go or some shit like that. Whatever, you, whatever your setting would be, it would give a lot better results for the year. And also it would make it so that it's not the end of the world if you don't win Worlds, you know? Like, that's... It's too harsh at the moment. Or make I it always... Like or make like a riff, always, okay. make Rift Rivals bigger, make Rift Rivals bigger, like split the world into two, like a, like West and the East and have it like be like a 16 team tournament. Like you have the winner of the Eastern Rift Rivals and winner of the Western Rift Rivals. So it is somewhat of a mini world before going into the actual world later. So ahead, previously, Tanner. before the National League uh, system was like properly set up in Europe, I always thought that you just eliminate Spring Split and you just basically give Spring Split back to the third party tournament organizers. And what you can do if Riot wants to stay involved, and I think they should, is that you could use that to give some sort of like initial seedings for Worlds. You could give a point system sure. uh, based on all of these tournaments to give like initial seeding sounds for Worlds. But the really good thing about this and the, the part that would make it difficult would be that these third party organizers would have the opportunity opportunity to make mini worlds tournaments at the same time we used to have loads of im tournaments mm -hmm. uh and i think if you created uh like basically a three months three four months in the year where it was still a third party reign i think that would be really good uh 
for Riot in terms of their branding because basically there, there's not that many good up and coming casters. We're really thinning the pool now as casters keep moving on. And like at one point, Blizzard were basically going to win just based on uh, nabbing as many strong casters as they could, but they only actually got Monty and Doa. And they need, they need a League of Legends circuit to build up all of this on screen, on air talent that they can then distribute at Worlds, at Europe, and all of this stuff. Because I, I honestly think that kind of scene is one scene that is not getting uh, as many new talents as it otherwise should. Like, uh, people will point to that we're getting Fosgrin now, but Fosgrin has actually been in the scene for absolutely ages, and now there's yes. like a gaping hole in China, uh, for example. There aren't that many English language casters to go around. I'm and I there. think Riot could think of it in terms of benefit in that way. There's also plenty of uh, talent that they'd be able to get behind the scenes from people who organize these tournaments. Uh, but it will overall be much better than compared to seeing, and I think it will be really good for viewership. And I think people will really look forward to this kind of swing split season. And maybe that's why I don't want to do it, because they might think that that will just take things away from the summer split. But I, I really think they should get rid of swing and do something like this. A lot of good points, but I don't think any of it will come to fruition with franchising yeah, in NA and with franchising in EU. I think spring and summer is just set to exist for yeah. like five yeah. to ten years. And no, no, no. Like, it, will, it will immediately devalue the yeah. uh, price of a slot if sure. you're not getting a complete monopoly over League of Legends tournaments okay. in a certain region and for, for that long. For three years, we already have world venues and world regions picked out. So I don't think anything's going to change regarding having like multiple worlds or like Rift Rivals being bigger, like all the suggestions we mentioned. Like Riot yeah. already planned out their next five years of competitive yeah. games, and it's going to take a massive, 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 like something to like get that train off course. I really do hope that they do do the academy uh, system inbuilt into the National League system because I really hope the National League system gets a lot more love uh, than it has been getting. It has all, they all has really good internal viewership, yeah. but uh, I think a lot of uh, like even Americans will actually come to love a lot of these tournaments and especially everyone will just love Spanish casters because they're just insane. What EU gets out of national tournaments, I hope NA gets out of collegiate. I think collegiate is like super important for NA and super mm -hmm. important you need better academy players and to have better academy players, you need something even something good to transition into academy and collegiate is perfect for that. So yeah. I hope the ideal path for pros in the future is you get really good in high school. And if you're a exceptional God level talent, you skip over straight to academy or straight over to LCS, but it goes something like high school and then you play college for a year or two, or you just go to college for free because you're good at League of Legends. And then you get picked up while you are in college and then you go to academy and then you do well yeah. in academy and then you go to L and then you go to LCS. I hope that is like a more stable path. So if you're yeah. a League of Legends player, you get to go to college for free. And if you're not good enough <laughs> to become a professional level player, at least you get free college education and you can take up different paths. But if you are good enough, you get the comfortable resting, comfortable of always going back to college if you ever need to or going straight all the way into college, academy, LCS. Yeah, like it's really difficult to set up a similar thing to either the European National League system or the China City system in North America. Because say you, say you did it by state, there are some states in America that are basically uninhabited and you are not going to be able to make league players out of that state. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really difficult. And I think the collegiate thing is the closest thing that they're ever going to have to it. It's just much harder to organize this kind of underclass over there. There's also the fact that league is proportionately less popular in America compared to how it is in Europe. Like in most of Europe outside of the UK, uh, PC gaming was the mainstay. Whereas in America, console gaming is permanently being the mainstay. And PC gaming was somewhat niche. That's being flipping. Uh, but console gaming is still very like you, you guys are the only guys that do professional uh, Call of Duty console tournaments. Like there's a European scene in that, but it is yeah. basically the equivalent of the North American league scene. You I know, mean, like it's it's not really there. There's like that high school league popping up, and with franchising and more money being spent into esports, people can invest heavier and heavier into younger and younger players. Like that's what China's doing. Like they're picking up what 16, 17 year olds and keeping yeah. them in farm leagues. Like as yeah, more money comes into the that. scene more money is going to go into player development also. So I, mean, I yeah. have, I, like, either League dies out or maybe League becomes a forever sport. If League becomes a forever sport, then there's going to be so much invested into younger and younger player base. I just want to say, oh, okay. Okay, I just want to say so people understand why I'm like, I guess it's good enough and it's the closest. It's the reason why it will never be, like, the same level as National League system is because you already have the arbitrary uh, line drawn that you have to essentially be doing a college education before you can be picked up by a collegiate team. And then when you are picked up by a collegiate team, 
that collegiate team will only be made up of players from within that same college. So these are two very arbitrary things that don't exist in the National League system. In the National League system, you can get entire teams of players that aren't necessarily within that specific country anyway. Like a lot of teams uh, now just have residency rules and these guys are full-time living in a different country playing said National League. Collegiate's going to be nowhere near that developed ever because they will always have the restrictions of literally being a collegiate league. And you can't necessarily do it in the States for the aforementioned reason I had uh, before. And also for the fact that the ping difference is going to matter so much more in America than it does in Europe right now. So like for all of these reasons, it's, it's going to be very, very, very difficult to do. I mean, if league becomes like super big in America, like they're going to have private servers. They're going to have like private scrim servers in East Coast, yeah. West Coast, like middle or what is it middle of america so people that live in texas yeah like they can like just scream on the middle like the middle server like that that i don't think ping will be a problem if league gets big enough yeah i agree with that but that's going to happen to europe first before it happens to north america but just sure, purely, I, mean, if maybe, purely I, I, I don't know so, like, we don't need to argue about it's that, such but. a it's such a it's just such a difficult point to get to it's a real shame because the 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 sort of underclass in america uh, when it comes to league of legends is, is being really overlooked especially with like the amount of imports that you guys got there are really good players like insanity for example that deserve to be recognized and should be recognized and the academy league didn't get as much love as it should have mm -hmm. i sense for and wants to move on so let's just end the Fucking sure. Uh, yeah. We've already done like twenty minutes about the collegiately. I'd be at the end okay. of the world. So let's see <laughs> cheers everyone. See you next world. Um, hey guys, what's up? It's Loco. I'm glad you guys have been enjoying our podcast with Doran, me, and all the wonderful guests that have come on to the show and gotten yelled at. I mean had healthy discussions. It's actually really fun making content with Dorian again and just making content in general. I love talk shows and I'm so happy I could be a part of one and host one. I would like to really thank GG Esports for sponsoring us and making this possible. Dorian and I usually just do this from the goodness and of our heart and love of content, but for the first time for me in a while, we were actually get we were actually able to get paid for doing a talk show, so I was really happy. And yeah, I really wanted to give a big shout out to them. It's been pretty fun working with them and at first there was a lot of conflict regarding like what the content would be in terms of incorporating a site but I think overall it turned out really nicely and it just fit in smoothly with the content that we were doing. And lastly, I want to talk to you guys about a brand new talk show with me and Doran coming out. It should be out either this weekend or Monday at the latest. It's gonna be called Listen Loco. Like how Doran says, listen, loco. So it's going to be sort of a spiritual continuation of Doran and loco at Worlds 2018 and also kind of like summoning insight. We're going to have it on for at least a year. That's our goal at the very least. As we pick up sponsors, we'll see where it goes. But yeah, it's going to be me and Doran. We're going to invite guests and we're going to talk about everything and anything League of Legends related. We have big plans for the show and... I hope you guys support it just as much as you guys supported Doran and Loco of 2018. Thank you to everyone that watched from me, Doran, GG Esports, and all the guests that were involved. Thank you guys so much.